Executive Director of the Port of Portland. It's a pleasure to uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> pleasure to welcome you all here this morning for uh, a topic that is indeed uh, very, very timely. I look out at the audience at a lot of people I recognize, a lot of consumers of transportation and transportation funding, transportation policy. Uh, and we, I, I think, uh, have attracted uh, just the right audience in this region for this conversation. Now, over the course of the last uh, two years or so, I think all of us have been reminded about what a challenging uh, topic this is. The intersection between uh, our region, uh, our state, our two states, and our country uh, have all come to kind of a fine point over the course uh, of the last couple of years on a number of subjects, from uh, certainly the Columbia River crossing uh, to the currently proposed bridge from nowhere to nowhere. Uh, <clears throat> we'll see how that uh, works out. Uh, and uh, uh, we've assembled here, I think, uh, several panels uh, to uh, look at a variety of topics, including, you know, the kind of the recent conversation, startling in some respects, about federal uh, devolution. Uh, and so I think uh, to kick things off this morning, uh, obviously uh, our convener uh, and someone who spent his entire uh, public life really devoted to uh, things like transportation, transportation policy, and whose imprint on this subject in this region is just indelible. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our Congressman, Earl Blumenauer. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you in the Port of Portland and Alaska Airlines for making my life uh, a little more livable. Um, I appreciate your leadership and friendship over the years, a uh, key role that the court plays. Uh, Ms. Lundgren reminded me about intermodalism. We can probably put more uh, uh, icons uh, if we're gonna carry this uh, around the country. We deeply appreciate your joining us today and I think Bill set uh, the right tone in terms of uh, the people who are here uh, from our region. Uh, are the right people at the right time uh, for the right conversation. The notion this morning is not just to uh, share ideas or rehash problems, uh, but to really deal with some of the steps that are being taken now, the alternatives, uh, how we build the partnerships so that we can build the infrastructure. Uh, this has been an extraordinary month in Congress. You may not uh, have picked it up from uh, behind the scenes, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, what we're going to do with these unaccompanied minors coming to the, uh, to the border or the fact that uh, we're going to sue the president um, for not implementing something we hate uh, fast enough. Um, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting uh, concept. I had suggested that we might adapt uh, a principle that some have felt uh, would be useful in terms of regulating litigation, and that is the principle of loser pays. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out where that goes. But we strip away uh, a lot of the uh, pre-election uh, goofiness uh, and dysfunction. And this last month was the single most rewarding for me in the area of what we're going to do about financing infrastructure. Uh, as some of you know, I transitioned from the Transportation Infrastructure Committee uh, to Ways and Means and then volunteered to be on the Budget Committee, now the eighth year, because I wanted to focus on infrastructure finance. Uh, that was a pitch to my leadership. It's something that I feel strongly about, and we've been working on as best we can. Uh, with a group of stakeholders in Washington, D.C. Some of you have uh, joined with us at the Library of Congress meetings that we hold uh, about every other month with uh, the wide range of folks who care about this. Uh, helping to make the case to ourselves, build the partnerships, deal with alternatives. Um, early, well, late last year, I introduced the first gas tax uh, increase that has been proposed in Congress in 21 years. 
There's a reason nobody has proposed increasing the gas tax for the last 21 years. Uh, but it's an important conversation, and I am pleased with what's happened. I've been pleased that we have representatives here uh, in the room that were with us when we unveiled uh, the gas tax proposal, uh, modeled on the Oregon experience. Uh, we had uh, the chamber, we'll hear from uh, in a moment, uh, AFL-CIO, construction trades, contractors, uh, transit, bicyclists, truckers, and AAA, um, saying we need to face up uh, and we're going to have to deal with this challenge. Uh, and if somebody's got a better idea, we welcome it. We welcome it. But it's critical that we call the question about whether or not there is going to be a federal infrastructure partnership that has meant so much for our community for so long. It's critical that we come together to start the conversation here because this is the first time in over half a century that there is no significant federal transportation project in the background. Not one. That's never happened since the dawn of the interstate free freeway system. We've had major road projects, bridge projects, light rail projects, but with the conclusion next September of the Milwaukee South, the bridge, uh, con closing the loop with the streetcar, uh, done. Now we hope that the federal payments continue to uh, finish that part of uh, the equation. But it's important for us to think about where we are, what we want, what's going to be the role of the state, the private sector, local governments, all who are facing an interrelated challenge. My commitment is to work with you to make sure that the federal government uh, is a full partner uh, in the wide range of infrastructure investments. The I in ice T, the intermodal, makes a difference. America is falling apart and it's falling behind. Those of you who spend time, for example, in uh, China, uh, what, Shanghai has 13 uh, subway lines, 20 major highway projects, uh, two massive modern airports, and a high-speed train leaving every three minutes. China has invested 8.5% of its gross domestic product for 20 years. And I think it's one reason that their economy has increased 700% while we're bumping along, we were down to 1.7% last year investment in infrastructure. And we're lucky uh, to think about maybe a 2% rate of growth. And our infrastructure that was once the finest in the world is now not so good. And you're gonna hear more about that uh, in a moment as we go forward. What we're attempting to do in Congress is to call this question. We fought very hard this month to give Congress just enough money to get through the year and stop the summer shutdown. But not enough transportation money to hop in to the next Congress, which is a prescription uh, to be not in the next Congress, but the Congress after that. And I don't think we can afford to kick this particular issue forward for three years or more. The problem is not going to get any less complex. It's not going to get any cheaper. The politics are not going to be easier. And our commitment is to work as hard as we can to make sure that this Congress steps up and gives you a question, the notion of what the resources are and hopefully a six-year robust reauthorization with dedicated funding. My proposal is very simply that I've been talking to some of my colleagues about is that raise the gas tax, a nickel a gallon for three years, index it for inflation, get rid of it in 12 years. The companion bill uh, modeled on the great work that's been done here in Oregon with a vehicle mile travel uh, fee is to extend that pilot project to any other state that wants it. Let them become comfortable with the concept. 
And so hopefully, in the course of the next three to five years, we can transition from something that's based on volume of fuel to actual road use and construct a whole new platform for transportation. Because as you know, we can do more with the technology than just keep track of how far people go and debit their account for road use. We can use it for transit, for parking, real-time transportation information about road conditions. Uh, the, all those certified smart young people in those Class B buildings downtown behind uh, screens with five liter bottles of Mountain Dew are just, think about, think about the applications that they can develop to enrich and improve the transportation process. And automobiles, as we know, are now just big computers with wheels. So there's a lot of potential going forward. But first, we've got some hard work to do. Bill mentioned the fact that there are some that are seriously thinking that this is an era that should close and that there is no need for a comprehensive national transportation policy. And that can just devolve to the states and slash the gas tax and it wouldn't even be an unfunded, unfunded mandate because they wouldn't have to do anything. Uh, I may not be stating that as artfully as some would ask, and we, we have a representative here today uh, to speak to that as well. It was voted on in the Senate. It had a couple dozen votes. This is some, there are people who are campaigning for the United States Senate right now, and this is part of their platform. We need to address that. Are we going to get out of the business? Are we going to increase resources, or are we just going to limp along in slow, steady decline? I deeply appreciate your giving us the better part of a morning to explore these issues. We're, we have an opportunity to hear from people who are on the front lines, who've been thinking about it, who have some issues to share with us, uh, some of their uh, concerns, their solutions. And I hope that out of this, we can do a better job in our community of engaging people in this vision. Because it's not going to happen without broad-based public support. And some of the things that we have done most successfully have built on that citizen infrastructure. And that is something I am deeply interested in your thoughts and observations about what I can do, what we all can do to help make sure that citizens are engaged in what this challenge is and helping shape it for our community and our state. Um, I want to turn first, if I could, to the first speaker. This, uh, this kind of, uh, this session this morning uh, was something that uh, Tamara Lundgren and I talked about some months ago about taking advantage of the fact that the United States Chamber has put its considerable political muscle behind the resource question. Um, and uh, actually Tom Donahue, the president of the chamber, and uh, Rich Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, have sort of an odd couple uh, show that they've taken around the country that's, that's entertaining uh, and it's informative. And Tamara was willing to take time, make a commitment uh, from her busy business schedule uh, to be part of the, se of the session today, to deal with the perspective of the chamber and some of the work. Tamara is uh, the perfect spokesperson to join us today. Um, she's uh, CEO of uh, uh, Schnitzer Industries here in town, a, uh, I want to say four generation, five generation uh, uh, company, had its roots here, uh, but now a, a, a publicly traded company uh, that, that is involved with uh, transportation locally, nationally, and internationally. She knows whereof she speaks. Um, and being part of the notion that we need to have a broader conversation. So I have deeply appreciated our conversations. I appreciate her leadership at the chamber to help make this a priority. And we're honored that she would take time to share some of her thoughts and observations with us here this morning. Tamara Lundgren. I'm delighted to be here and I was 
uh, saying to the congressman earlier this morning that I've never been part of anything so efficient. Earl and I had dinner uh, three or four months ago, and out of out of dinner and one telephone conversation, his staff and, and uh, the partners in this room put together this terrific program, and I'm really delighted to be here. But I also want to spend a moment and thank the congressman for his leadership on infrastructure issues in Washington. And as he mentioned, and I'm sure most of you know, late last week, the Senate joined the House in passing a short-term, or what, what many of us refer to a temporary funding bill, to keep the Highway Trust Fund solvent. And while I think that we all can agree that a stopgap funding measure is an inefficient way to run America's transportation program, we should all be grateful that at a time of intense political infighting and legislative gridlock, there remains strong bipartisan support for federal highway funding. And Congressman Blumenauer helped to make this happen by casting a spotlight on infrastructure policy, including right here in Portland, where we have both significant assets and significant challenges. Here and across America, much of our infrastructure is unsafe, inefficient, and a drag on our economy. And this needs to change. It's not a choice. It's an economic imperative, and it's a moral imperative. It's economic because by making the necessary improvements and investments in our infrastructure, we create jobs and we increase the competitiveness of America. And it's a moral imperative, and most people don't connect morality and infrastructure, but it's a moral imperative because by making the necessary improvements in our infrastructure, we can save lives and help clean the environment. I am sure that there is no shortage of community and business leaders here today who wonder how transportation gridlock can be solved when there is so much gridlock in Congress. But here's the good news. Although there's an extraordinary amount of disagreement in Washington, when it comes to infrastructure, both sides of the political aisle agree that a modern, seamless, and most importantly, safe infrastructure system is critical. There may be fierce deba debates over how to pay for it and the extent of federal involvement, but there's broad agreement on the fundamentals. It's an issue that people with opposing viewpoints are rallying around. In fact, as the congressman said, the presidents of the AFL-CIO and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have testified before Congress together, and they have appeared on national news programs together in support of infrastructure investment, and I don't have to tell you that that in and of itself is unique, but it's also inspiring. And so as a result, we are actually seeing some legislative action. Earlier this year, in a great bipartisan achievement, Congress reauthorized the Water Resources Development Act for five years, and that's a huge victory for the Port of Portland and for marine assets around the country. As I mentioned earlier, last week the House and Senate each passed a bill to extend highway funding for 10 months, preventing what would have been a disastrous cut in payments to the states. And while a 10-month extension is nothing to crow about, it definitely beats the alternative of doing nothing at all. And though the business community welcomes these positive steps forward and their immediate beneficial impacts, we really can and must do more. Communities are planning projects far into the future. Businesses are designing growth and investment strategies that are measured in years, not in three or 10 month segments. States need to know that the funding will be there when they need it. And businesses must have the confidence that an efficient, well-maintained, and intermodal infrastructure will be in place to support their operations. What we need, what we need is a long-term strategy for infrastructure investment. The system must be able to meet our nation's needs, not just tomorrow, but for years and for decades to come. It won't be easy to achieve, but I believe we have the potential to do it because our leaders have shown that they are willing to act, which is probably why the congressman said last month was one of his best ever. So now we must push them to act more boldly and more decisively. So for the next few minutes, allow me to briefly elaborate on the imperative for infrastructure investment for all those important reasons I mentioned at the outset. Jobs, economic competitiveness, public safety, and environmental responsibility. 
So let me begin with the safety. At a minimum, Americans should be able to get from point A to point B without putting themselves or their families at risk. And I'm not talking about getting splashed with coffee when you hit a pothole on your commute to work. There are serious deficiencies in our infrastructure system that cost lives or cause injury every year. And probably the deadliest in recent memory was the tragic collapse of the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis. You know, could it happen again? Each of us can be the judge of that. Today, one in every nine of our nation's bridges is structurally deficient. 400 of them are in Oregon. And another 1,300 in this state, in Oregon, have been rated functionally obsolete by the American Society of Civil Engineers. And those are just the bridges. 65% that is significantly more than half, 65% of Oregon's roadways are in poor or mediocre condition. And here's the scary part. In many other parts of the country, the conditions are far worse and the safety hazards are more dangerous. So this is a national challenge. And any casualty or injury is a result of our failure to adequately maintain our roads and bridges, and that's wholly unacceptable. Very simply, to invest in infrastructure is to invest in safety and to save American lives. And there's also the environmental imperative. Outdated and inefficient infrastructure is driving much of the congestion that's gripping our cities. On top of the lost productivity and personal frustration, it takes a toll on the environment and on our resources. Some estimate that congestion costs the American public $121 billion a year in lost time and wasted fuel. Thousands of tons of pollutants are being pumped into the air we breathe due to congestion and traffic jams. If we invest in the projects that will ease gridlock and reduce the time that cars sit idling on clogged freeways, we can reduce emissions and avoid wasting fuel. So beyond the obvious imperatives of public safety and environmental responsibility, there's another critical reason we must invest in infrastructure, and that is our competitive standing in the world is on the line. Infrastructure impacts the ability of American businesses to compete in the global economy, and it impacts the ability of our nation to compete in the world. To be truly competitive, we need a national infrastructure system that is safe, that's efficient and sufficiently funded. It must be intermodal, interconnected, and seamless. And for all the reasons I've already discussed, our system is not living up to those standards. U.S. infrastructure has steadily slipped in the World Economic Forum's global infrastructure ratings. We have fallen 20 spots down from number one in as many years. In 20 years, we've fallen from number one to number 20. Meanwhile, as a congressman said, developing nations have been busy building their own systems. Emerging markets, they get the link between infrastructure investment and economic development. It's a key part of their growth strategies. The United States must catch up, and not for pride or for rankings, but to maintain an advantage in the global economy. U.S.-based businesses, like the metals recycling company I run, require a competitive physical platform for successful operations. Schnitzer Steel relies on sound and efficient infrastructure to move materials from our 120 operating facilities in the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico to our customers around the world. We transport our products by rail, by ship, by barge, and truck, and we operate out of seven deep water ports on both coasts, exporting to some 20 countries around the world. Infrastructure projects that suffer for lack of consistent or available funding, even right here in our own community, can create a ripple effect in our operations and impact how efficiently we can serve our global customers. Those kind of snags make it harder for us to create value for our stakeholders, keep up with our competitors, grow the economy, and most importantly, create jobs. A well-maintained infrastructure system is also essential to attracting more job-creating businesses and capital to the United States. America has so many natural advantages in the global competition for business. 
Our vast and varied infrastructure network should and must and has to be one of them. We're competing with the world for capital and investment more directly. We're competing for jobs and we're competing for growth. Foreign direct investment in the United States translates directly into growth in our economy and jobs for our workers. Factors like falling US energy prices and rising labor costs in places like China have helped to precipitate a manufacturing renaissance in the United States. So positive developments in these areas are not only bringing back US manufacturing that had gone overseas, but it, they're also helping to attract new manufacturing and investment from foreign companies into the United States. In fact, more than 17% of the US manufacturing workforce is supported by overseas companies operating on our shores. That's 17% of the US manufacturing workforce, almost one fifth. This budding renaissance won't last very long without a competitive infrastructure platform. Job creators must have the confidence that they can smoothly move their products to markets in the, in, in the US and around the world by way of a safe and seamless infrastructure system. If it's too costly or too complicated for companies to operate in or with the United States, they'll take their business elsewhere and they'll contribute jobs and growth to other economies. And this doesn't have to happen, but we need to be willing to make the right choices and the smart investments now in order to benefit from the trends that are just beginning to move in our favor. So in addition to these imperatives for rebuilding our infrastructure, let's not overlook the potential for immediate job creation. America has the best builders in the world. Vast numbers of construction workers were sidelined during the Great Recession, and many have struggled to get back into the workforce during the long reco recovery. They are ready, and they are willing, and they can begin the work of rebuilding our country today if we invest in the projects that will allow them to do so. And when people are given the opportunity to go back to work, they have renewed spending power that can help accelerate economic growth. A major effort to rebuild this country could simultaneously strengthen what has been a slow and disappointing economic recovery. So I hope I've convinced you that investing in American infrastructure is a good bet on many levels. But now, of course, comes the hard part. How do we pay for it? There are funding challenges across our system, but the one that most urgently requires our attention is to replenish and sustain the Highway Trust Fund over the long haul. 54% of Oregon's annual investments, and more than half of Oregon's annual investment in highway capital projects, is supported by the Highway Trust Fund. It's vital that these, re that these resources remain steady and sufficient. As I mentioned earlier, the business community welcomed the, the recent temporary patch to the fund, but it's hardly a permanent solution. Next year, the Highway Trust Fund is projected to have a $13 billion cash shortfall. And without increasing anything, by 2020, the shortfall is projected to be $100 billion. The business community, our partners in labor and industry, and national leaders must work together to find a long-term solution to a challenge that will not go away on its own. Now, when you say that to a room full of legislators and policymakers in Washington, you'll see every one of them nodding in agreement. But when it comes to time to talk about how to pay for it, one by one, the nodding stops. So I'll start with the easy part. What will not work? We know we can't continue to rely on short-term Band-Aid fixes. That clearly isn't getting the job done, and it won't serve our long-term needs. We know we can't simply devolve responsibility to the states, of some, as some have proposed, and expect to maintain a national system that is interconnected and seamless. And we know the consequences of, dis of decreased investment would be severe. It would raise the cost of goods, create more congestion and safety hazards, reduce mobility, slow our, our economy, and hamper our competitiveness. So how do we start talking about what will work? We have put a number of ideas on the table for debate and consideration. One obvious answer is simple 
it's straightforward, and it's direct, and it's probably why it's not very popular. And that's to raise the gas tax user fee at the pump. It hasn't been done in 20 plus years, and major increases in fuel efficiency mean that people can and do drive more miles while paying relatively less in taxes to maintain the system. So it's an un, the, the, the better fuel mileage was an unintended <clears throat> negative consequence for the Highway Trust Fund. A modest phased in increase in the gas tax would provide more federal funding for highways and transit. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce believes that this is one of the most promising solutions, and we appreciate lawmakers like Congressman Blumenauer for having the courage to say so. But that's not the only idea that should be considered. We need to improve regulations, incentives, and legal protections in order to attract more private capital to infrastructure projects. There are hundreds of billions of dollars in the capital markets and in major pension funds that could, could potentially be unlocked and invested if we change our way of thinking about infrastructure. The government's role is critical, but not every project has to be wholly financed, owned, and operated by the government. We should be far more open to public-private partnerships and privately financed, owned, and operated facilities, just as many of our global competitors have been doing and are doing throughout Europe and in Asia. And we must not overlook the need for further reforms and efficiencies in the way we decide upon plan, build, regulate, and operate our transportation facilities. Many of my more conservative friends argue that there is still significant waste in how we develop, build, and operate our infrastructure system. And I tell them that they are absolutely right. But that's not an excuse to let the program go broke. It's a reason to fight to make it better. Policymakers must improve transparency and accountability, especially when it comes to how projects are selected, implemented, and paid for. You know, taxpayers might actually be more open to supporting a gas tax or other user fees if they knew where the money was going and had the confidence that it would be used prudently. Streamlining the regulatory system and permitting process could also help draw investment and allow job creating projects to move forward more quickly. Spending 20 years reviewing a project is not a way of creating near term jobs. In fact, Increasing the private sector role in American infrastructure can help bring private sector innovations to the system, which is another thing that Congressman Blumenauer was just mentioning. And that's another good reason to remove barriers and facilitate access to private capital. It comes down to this. We need to be willing to explore all of the options because the alternative, doing nothing at all, isn't acceptable. We need more leaders who are willing to show courage and leadership and propose real solutions. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce believes that we must invest for the long term in the kind of infrastructure system that befits a great and ambitious nation like the United States. And I believe we have real potential to do it because lawmakers and leaders understand how much is at stake. They recognize that letting our infrastructure system, one of our greatest national assets, letting it fall into disrepair is unacceptable. They understand that mobility is essential to our standard of living and that our citizens expect and deserve a safe, efficient, and environmentally responsible system. They see how infrastructure physically connects us to the world and is a crucial conduit for commerce. They recognize that the federal government must continue to have a role in helping to maintain and modernize our system through stable and reliable funding. And they know that we have much to gain by building world-class infrastructure, including improving our safety and environmental record, creating jobs and economic growth in the short term, and prosperity and competitiveness in the long term. And that's why infrastructure is an issue that should transcend politics and continue to bring together groups like business and labor. While there is a stalemate on so many other issues, Congress and the President have demonstrated 
that when it comes to infrastructure, they are willing to act. So now, we have the responsibility to push them to act more boldly, more decisively, and more strategically. Coming up with a long-term solution to our infrastructure challenges won't be easy. Nothing in Washington ever is. But if there's a chance to do something significant for the good of this country, infrastructure is it. So thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to the speakers and the panels that follow. Thank you. <clears throat> exactly what we'd hoped for. Um, and let me say that uh, your point that at one juncture in our, uh, usually in our history, uh, infrastructure is something that has brought people together. Uh, and I think that is true, whether it's the transcontinental railroad or the interstate highway system. And I think it can happen again. One of the reasons I'm optimistic is this coalition that I referenced. And a number of you are associated with groups and organizations that have a presence in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, I want you to know that your, whatever your dues money, the, the time and energy you spend supporting the organizations, it's made a big difference in this conversation because there are lots of certified smart, bright people in D.C. who represent these groups and organizations, this coalition. Uh, one of them is here today. Uh, Janet Kavanoki uh, is uh, 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 a key staff member at the Chamber of Commerce who's focused on this and has been part of that stakeholder group of people who are trying to find solutions and drive it forward. And sometimes there are some odd combinations of people at the same table. But that is one of the reasons why I'm optimistic. Bright, smart people cooperating uh, provide, I think, that foundation. The reference was also made to uh, Richard Trumka, the AFL-CIO president who's worked with uh, Tom Donahue. Uh, well, Mr. Trumka was busy today. Um, he wanted to be here. Uh, he heard that you were going to be here and the focus of this. But we got the second best person uh, from the AFL-CIO in the country, um, Tom Chamberlain. Uh, Tom is not just the president of the Oregon AFL-CIO, but he is uh, a powerful advocate for uh, economic development, for treating employees, uh, workers in a humane, sustainable fashion, fighting for family values. Uh, I first encountered him when he was a firefighter at the city of Portland, um, a good firefighter. He was also a very good union representative. Uh, honing those skills, fun to work with, um, memorable conversations. Uh, and uh, it's been great over the years to watch him uh, blossom as a statewide leader uh, with a portfolio of uh, things that he does in his spare time in civic leadership. And we are pleased that he is here on crutches this morning uh, to share uh, perspective uh, from the, uh, uh, the AFL-CIO, Mr. Tom Chamberlain. we agree and sometimes we don't, but Earl gets every, everyone's opinion, their perspective. Whether he agrees with you or not, he's going to ask. And as I've matured as a leader, I find myself agreeing with Earl more and more. I don't know what that means, but uh, I, tend to get, I get the economy now that uh, I represent workers from across the state. And in AFL, we represent 12.5 million union workers and 4 million associated members, 56 affiliates. And in Oregon, uh, we represent 300,000, 300,000 in Oregon, from hospitals to manufacturing, firefighters to teachers, bus drivers to engineers, and almost 25,000 in the construction sector. 
Workers understand that the economy is interrelated, interconnected, like pieces of a puzzle. We are the most productive workforce on the planet, and we're not afraid of competition. But to be competitive in a global economy requires that we have a world-class infrastructure. America's lack of investment to maintain and modernize our transportation system is undermining our competitive edge. Currently, there are more than 100,000 active projects nationwide, paving roads, uh, rebuilding our bridges, and modernizing our transportation system. Workers depend on this investment for their very livelihood. Oregon workers, as we speak, Oregon workers are laying track, installing power lines to connect uh, downtown Portland, OHSU, to Milwaukee. They're repaving stretch stretches of Oregon's highway. And construction workers are restriping and rebuilding the historical Columbia Highway, a world-class attraction to bike tourism, which in, in turn will bring more and more tourist dollars to Oregon. They're working on the, the Selwood Bridge and other transportation projects throughout the state. Our construction workforce are highly, highly trained and competitive. They get the job done on budget and on time. <clears throat> and these jobs are good paying middle class jobs with benefits, retirement, uh, and a good retirement. Americans need to know what is being done to provide a long-term, sustainable investment in repairing and rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers in the 2013-2014 Infrastructure Report Card, Oregon has 433 bridges that are structurally deficient. 65% of our roads are in poor and mediocre uh, conditions. And driving in those roads, which are in need of repair, costs Oregonians, just Oregonians, a half a billion dollars a year. In vehicle repairs and increased operating costs. And the World Economic Forum's Global Competitive Reports for 2013-14, our infrastructure rating has dropped from 7, 7%, 7 to 15. Our, frankly, our economy is bleeding middle class jobs. Those jobs that pay the mortgage, put food on the table, savings for college, jobs that provide health care and retirement. We know that an investment in our infrastructure creates the fastest way to create good paying middle class jobs. Infrastructure invent, investment is essential to regaining America's competitive edge in a global economy stemming the erosion of middle-class jobs and hopefully re reversing the, that erosion. We make things in Oregon. We make and grow stuff. We make rail cars, barges, plane components, trucks. And our workers, they like going to work, they like being productive, and they like feeding and clothing their family. But for us to continue to do that, and we're playing a losing game right now, we are playing a losing game. You heard about China, you heard about what's going on in Europe, and in Oregon and in the United States, we aren't thinking how do we maintain, how do we maintain that competitive edge when actually we're losing it. We have trade agreements, we're in a global economy now, and we have to compete at a global level. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Congressman uh, Blumenauer for his leadership, and I will be very interested to hear your thoughts in fixing this problem as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And the operative notion of uh, how uh, we are going to uh, listen to one another, we have a variety of panels that will be uh, presented. And at the conclusion of the program, guaranteed everybody's out of here at noon. I mean, anybody can leave at any time, but this is uh, done uh, by noon. But we will have, uh, at the conclusion of the formal presentations, an opportunity for an open mic. Uh, where anybody who wants their minute in the sunshine, Charlie, like uh, appearing before the council, 
uh, where we would uh, be very interested in people's comments or questions uh, as a part of this process. Uh, but we have another speaker here, uh, our state treasurer, uh, Ted Wheeler, who I found out uh, actually lives across the street of the, uh, of the home of one of my predecessors, uh, Congressman uh, Hawley, uh, who uh, was the, uh, one of the famous architects of the Smoot-Hawley tariffs that almost tanked the American economy, uh, an illustrious <laughs> predecessor. Uh, and Ted gets to look at that house every day as he leaves for work, uh, thinking about how to improve the economy. Um, so he thinks great thoughts. He's also a Renaissance person. He's had, he's uh, written widely. He, uh, I think you just did an iron yeah. person competition. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in awe of uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but in his stewardship of uh, our investments as state treasurer has uh, devoted significant time and energy into the implications of infrastructure. And Ted, we really appreciate your work and your willingness to share some of your observations with us here this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you, Congressman. I appreciate it. Thanks again for your leadership on what's obviously a very important issue. Uh, but Congressman, seriously, you have to be careful about what you say. Uh, when you tell the mayor that it's just like open testimony in the city council, did you notice how fast he ran out of the room? <laughs> just kidding, Charlie. I know you're, you're here for the long run. Uh, so uh, the, the good news and the bad news about going after such uh, eminent speakers as the ones we've just had is I'm basically going to disregard the notes I have because they're largely repetitive and that means I get to have a little bit of fun and maybe I'll be a little more provocative than I wanted to be originally and I want to start with the premise that everybody in this room is here because we already understand the importance of infrastructure and we understand the need and we're concerned about it I'm certainly concerned about it not just from an economic competitiveness perspective but as I get a little bit older and I think about my child and other people her age, I actually start to think about legacy. And I start thinking about the legacy that we were left with. And I think about the great infrastructure movement from the 1920s that really went all the way through the 1970s. It was basic stuff. It was electrification. It was water. Uh, it was uh, interstate highways. And all of those things seemed like no-brainers for our predecessors, people like us, people who were older, people who had found themselves in positions of community leadership, and they fought hard to build that infrastructure. And we were the ones who benefited from that infrastructure development. The legacy they left us with was an economic boom, unlike anything this nation or this world, frankly, had ever seen. And so it's kind of shocking to be here amongst friends, amongst opinion leaders, amongst those who believe and understand in the importance of infrastructure and feel a little bit like I'm in the land of the lost. I mean, for those of you who've been around, uh, we all understand that there are aspects to infrastructure which are modernizing at the speed of light. Automobiles, for example. I don't know how many people here have a Tesla or a Volt but they're state-of-the-art automobiles, and yet the roads we drive on are dinosaurs. And I think about all of the problems that have led to that incongruous situation between the cars we drive and the roads that we drive on. And I realize a lot of the problems we've created are almost ridiculous by nature, jurisdictional overlap, competition amongst jurisdictions, insufficient funding for the obvious kinds of investments that we should be making, inappropriate strategies for maintaining and replacing aging infrastructure, or infrastructure that's reached capacity. And I ask myself, what is it actually going to take? If I can continue my sort of silly analogy of the land of the lost, what does it take to actually extricate ourselves from this tar pit in which we find ourselves. And I know a lot of you in local government are, are 
you can empathize with the description I just gave. And I, I want to digress and tell a little bit of a story that many of you have heard, but it, it's a good story, I think. It entertains me, so I'm going to tell it since I'm here. <laughs> but years ago, when I was a county officer, I was responsible in large part for keeping the Selwood Bridge project moving forward. And Earl kept asking me these really annoying, insightful, important questions. And the one that was the most annoying of all, because I really couldn't answer it, was, okay, let's say you get the build, bridge built. I was like, oh my gosh, we're never going to get this bridge built. And he's like, well, assume you do. Then what? What do you do about the Hawthorne? What do you do about the Morrison? What do you do about the Burnside? What do you do about all the other infrastructure that you're responsible for? Where are you going to get the resources? How are you going to procure it? Who are you going to talk to? Who are your partners? Where are you going to get the expertise? And I thought about my situation at that time on the Selwood Bridge. I'm sitting across the table from people like John and others, and experts from Bechtel and David Evans and Associates and elsewhere. And I had a secret that I will share with you now. The secret is, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I can share that secret because I know most jurisdictional leaders in this state have exactly as much knowledge as I did then. Let's talk about Multnomah County for just a second. Uh, Mike, you're disqualified from AOC. Mike MacArthur, good guy if you haven't met him. Multnomah County was created a long time ago, as urgent urban legend says, by the distance a horse had to travel to get to a courthouse. The bridges over the Willamette River became the responsibility of Multnomah County by virtue of the fact that there were a bunch of criminals on the Board of County Commissioners, and sometime like in 1910, give or take 15 years, the state legislature intervened and said, no, 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 all the roads are going to the city of Portland, all the bridges are going to Multnomah County. That's how we divvied it up. So today, Charlie and, and, and Steve and others here from the city have to deal with all the roads leading right up to the bridges, and then Multnomah County deals with the bridges. And I got thinking to myself, I wonder if they have this problem in China, <laughs> where the responsibility for critical regional transportation infrastructure is dependent upon the time it takes a horse to get to a courthouse and a bunch of crooks. That's how we still structure decisions around infrastructure in this state. And I'm not saying that to embarrass the state, because our state, as you all know, I mean, just by virtue of the fact of who else is in this room, we're pretty progressive when it comes to the issue of infrastructure. And Tamara's comments about the private sector and the imperative, I, I thought were, were spot on. So we have these problems in terms of structure. And we have these problems in terms of procurement. We also have problems with regard to financing. Yeah, you know, Tamara mentioned, the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning her twice is she mentioned there's actually a lot of resources out there for infrastructure. She's right. Since I became your state treasurer, I have personally voted for something in the neighborhood of close to a billion dollars in financing for infrastructure. In China, in Latin America, in Europe, and elsewhere. And my peers and I, Fellow state treasurers, we keep scratching our head and asking ourselves, why aren't we investing these resources right here in the United States? Why aren't we investing them in projects we know will put people back to work? And more importantly, I knew that was going to be Joe. I'm looking around and saying, that's got to be Joe. But he's right. Why aren't we investing those resources right back here in the United States? Not only to put people to work, but also to lay that foundation for future economic competitiveness. And that precipitated another conversation, which I'll get to in a minute. But first, one more digression. Earl, you really do deserve a lot of credit, because you are working in a very rough, 
political environment. And I think we have to call it out, and we have to call it out for what it is. There is an ideological movement in the United States House of Representatives that opposes long-term investments regardless of the value to our society. And as long as that ideological roadblock exists in the United States Congress, it's gonna hold us back from economic competitiveness and it's going to reduce commerce and trade opportunities, not only domestically, but overseas. And we all know it. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, a lot of smart people here in this state, uh, my staff at the state treasury, myself, as a leader of the state treasury, we've been meeting with leaders up and down the west coast to talk about public infrastructure. We've met with leaders from California, from Washington, from British Columbia, and we formed a partnership. And the goal of the partnership is to look at new approaches. Clean slate. And Karen Williams, who is here, is very active in helping to lead that effort. And so I'm sure she'd be delighted to share specifics later on in a panel or otherwise. So we started asking ourselves, what is the public sector good at and what is the private sector good at? This is not the time for jokes, by the way. But the public sector is really good at regulating and the public sector is good at providing opportunities for input and accountability. The public sector is good at delivering public services. The private sector is good at planning, at procurement, providing private sector capital, and operating. And we started asking ourselves, are there promising models out there that take into account the strengths of both sectors? And we've landed on a few that we think show promise. And we're actually at the point, thanks to the 2014 legislature, where we have now been giving funding and a directive, the state treasury, to pursue some trial projects and use some different procurement models and see if we can be successful in moving projects that heretofore have not been successfully moved. We looked at 35 projects across the state. We've landed on seven, seven projects. Some we can talk about, some we haven't closed the details and can't talk about. But generally speaking, the ones I can tell you about, the Multnomah County Courthouse, the Wise Water Project in the Rogue Valley, education projects at a state university and a high school, and an energy project, seven projects. They're very different, they're in different parts of the state, but they all have a couple of things in common. First of all, they're big and they're complex relative to the local jurisdiction's capacity. Second of all, they're all critical projects to Oregonians and critical to our future economic prosperity. The key for us is how do we reinvent the public sector relationship with the private sector, particularly when it comes to private sector capital and private sector experience in the planning, procurement, and operations of infrastructure. But there's an important, important catch that I want to make crystal clear. The legislature in providing funding and the directive made it clear to us that the models we evaluate must retain public ownership of the infrastructure and there must be public accountability for how we go about doing it. And so those are sort of the primary responsibilities that we have. I want to give you just one example to clarify the types of projects. The Wise Water Project I mentioned in Rogue Valley. Everybody here knows where the Rogue Valley is, right? You've all been to Southern Oregon, Medford, Ashland, that region. It's a very important part of our state. 200,000 Oregonians call it home. Agriculture is king there. It represents about $170 million a year in resources for that part of the state. And obviously, that component of agriculture is critical to the agricultural industry here in the state generally. Obviously, water is critical to agriculture. The Wise Water Project, if it is developed, and this is a project that's been on the books for probably as long as uh, either the Selwood Bridge was on the books or as long as the Multnomah County Courthouse 
has been on the books. The Wise Water Project would give us an opportunity to connect public and private sector partners in a way that it increases irrigation opportunities for that part of the region. It would increase crop yields and crop values. It would also reduce smudging. If you don't know what smudging is, come find me later. But smudging is a very environmentally damaging practice that could be reduced through development of this project. And it would also have a significant impact on the purity of the water. And that has ramifications that go well beyond agriculture into recreation, uh, into salmon habitat, which obviously supports other critical industries to the state of Oregon. The problem is the price tag is $200 million, and it's a very complex project. And the bottom line is it is beyond the capacity of the local jurisdictions, think horse and criminals, to be able to get the project done. And so we're actually very confident that at least one of the models that we've landed on could help us see that project through. So we're very excited about those prospects. If these procurement models work that we are developing, we'll expand them statewide. And that, I think, will give us the opportunity to improve our economic competitiveness, support jobs and families, and enhance the livability that we're all here to ultimately talk about. In closing, I just want to put a challenge out there for all of us. As, and I really don't know why I'm in this kind of mood, but just increasingly I am. Um, you know, we're not young anymore. And here we are in a room at Portland State University. We've all been invited by a prominent congressman because we're leaders in various capacities, in the private sector, in labor, in business, in government, in the community. We're all leaders. And the responsibility for legacy now rests squarely on our shoulders. And it's not good enough to illustrate the problem or talk about the obstacles. The burden is now on us to actually do things differently and be not afraid to try approaches that at first glance might seem unpopular or unwise to help us move this very important issue forward. Other countries already do it. We should be doing many of the same practices here, but we should be doing it with an Oregon twist. And I look forward to working with all of you to make sure that we get that done. Thank you, Congressman, for having me here today. Thank you all for the great work that you're undertaking. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Next, we have uh, our uh, director of the State Department of Transportation, Matt Garrett. Um, I've known Matt for years and years and years. Uh, he, uh, uh, he comes by his transportation chops honestly through his wife, uh, <laughs> Lori, who was at TriMet, uh, was with the Surface Transportation Policy Group. Matt was finishing his graduate work, and uh, she was in Washington, D.C., and Matt was uh, working at that point with uh, Senator Hatfield, uh, and we've just had a, a terrific opportunity to be able to watch some of this together, and a member of that great uh, alumni association of Senator Hatfield who uh, made such a difference in our region in terms of being able to make that federal partnership work. Matt, you want to talk to us a little bit about ODOT and uh, how there might be a challenge to it? Thank you. What's the saying behind every man is a great woman? Well, that's my case. The senator just called me out on that, or the congressman just called me out on that. I first want to thank Congressman Blumenau, because he's a man of vision, he's a man of leadership, and he's a man of courage, and he was speaking about this issue long before the last week or so, before an August break when uh, we had to put skin in the game to allow us to fully and promptly pay the individuals that are building the infrastructure across this nation. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your vision for today and your vision for the future. Ms. Lundgren, amen. I have not heard a more articulate, eloquent, clear and concise presentation um, in a long while. Your call uh, of the question and your call to action is perfect. Thank you very much. 
Uh, and as best, my comments will only draft off the position of the pace that you just said. And to my friend Ted Wheeler, Ted helped me out advocate in 2012 for a transportation funding package, and let's add a couple transportation projects to that list of seven. Um, we can do good things with the finan financing mechanism that we are putting in place here. We can leverage opportunity as well as wisdom, innovation, and creativity. Let's be there. If one subscribes, as I do, to the notion that the transportation infrastructure is the foundation, the backbone, the spine of our economy, and that no state, no community, no level of government can maintain its economic health and its livability for its citizens, if it allows that foundation to crumble, then we have to hold that notion up against the three potential pathways that the congressman identified early on at the federal level. We either increase revenues or we stand idle and do nothing, which is actually a step backwards, but it also yields about a 30% reduction in transportation funding. And let me tell you what that means for the state of Oregon. That's $150 million less money coming in to the coffers here to build the infrastructure to pay our citizens. Or devolution, or I define it as abdication of leadership. But those are the three positions that were outlined, the pathways, the conversations that are transpiring. And because this is not an abstract proposal, I would submit to you we need to ask three additional questions, questions that were asked 20-some years ago by very smart people. But riddle me this. Does the state of Oregon have unmet transportation needs, transportation opportunities? Submit to you the answer is yes. Is the state of Oregon deferring? Is it neglecting investment in those opportunities? Submit to you the answer is yes. And will the state of Oregon and its businesses and its citizens come to regret this position? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. So what do we do about this? Let me suggest the following. First, let us be extremely wary of efforts that use abdication or devolution as an excuse for reducing federal fiscal commitment and policy to those programs that are essential, that are vital to the economic well-being of this great state. Let us be wary of efforts that would have us step backwards, slide backwards, allowing the current condition of the system, which is fairly healthy right now, but all you need to do is project, project out several years and you can see the pavement conditions, the bridge conditions, all the infrastructure of a healthy transportation system start to decline and the momentum it creates is a challenge that may be too formidable to recover from. So let us not sink uh, a condition that is healthy now and take with it our state businesses' economic competitiveness and advantages as well as the productivity gains that we see today and into the future. But let us now advance some notions uh, or pathways that promote discipline, a well-vetted partnership, a managed approach to the way we make investment in transportation infrastructure here. Let us not be penny wise and pound foolish in our investments uh, in terms of the economic health of this state. Because I would submit to you, and it's been said many times, that transportation policy is not an end of itself. It's a means to an end. And we find ourselves at a hinge moment, I think, with transportation policy now embedded in the conversations of environmental policy, energy policy, economic policy, land use policy, health policy. Let's leverage the collective wisdom, the collective resources of all those policies and align uh, and integrate a conversation that better uses our people and our monies here. So put simply, the only pathway that has a positive impact on the flow of commerce and the movement of people through and beyond the state of Oregon 
is one which has us investing in ourselves, investing to build rather than dismount. So let us strengthen a transportation system with strategic investments on our roads, on our bridges, on our transit, aviation, and rail systems, and every component that makes a robust and healthy transportation network. Let us invest in transportation options, commute options, that allow our citizens to walk, bike, ride a bus, light rail or a streetcar, or drive a truck or an automobile on a safe and efficient transportation system. I want to close now because I'm going to be quick because unfortunately I've got to get down to Salem to take on some other dragons that we're fighting here. But let me close with a quotation from a great transportation prophet, scholar, Charles Darwin. Mr. Darwin says that in the long history of humankind and animal kind as well, those who have learned to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. So I think the charge of this transportation Illuminati that sits before me is the following. Let us act, let us choose a pathway of collaboration and improvisation. Let us choose a pathway that allows us to prevail. To prevail in enhancing the transportation system, to prevail in strengthening this state and in turn the nation's economic health. And let us put paychecks in people's hands to rebuild this infrastructure. Congressman, thank you for this time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Uh, a tough job. Uh, the state made some uh, transportation commission, legislature, uh, made some difficult decisions to try and move projects, taking advantage of a, of a good bidding climate, uh, need to get the economy going, but uh, it's given you some constraints going forward if we don't keep that, that uh, federal commitment. It's going to make a hard job even more difficult. Uh, but I appreciate uh, the theme that uh, we have, a number of our speakers have dealt with in terms of thinking about how to do things differently. Um, because we are going to have to challenge assumptions. Uh, we do need to make sure that we're taking advantage of technology. We need to learn from the past. We need to look at what's going on in other sectors. And it's fair to challenge, I think, assumptions. Uh, I am pleased that uh, John Charles is here. Uh, John, I've known for, I don't know, over a third of a century, uh, uh, head of uh, the Oregon Environmental Council for a number of years. Uh, more recently, uh, has uh, been active with the Cascade Policy Institute. Um, now, uh, John and I probably have not agreed quite so much uh, you know, of recent years about some of the policy prescriptions. But I admire uh, his uh, personal commitment, his values, uh, his uh, thoughtful approach uh, to uh, his beliefs, and the notion of how we are injecting more economic discipline. And this is an area where, regardless of how you feel about the federal role in transportation or devolution, I think all of us agree that the extent to which we're able to inject additional economic discipline into the system, uh, making things performance-based, uh, is part of the long-term solution that we need to address. And in fact, it's part of, I think, some of the short-term solutions. Uh, so John, I appreciate uh, your joining with us uh, to uh, deal with some other approaches that are being advocated. And again, appreciate your rigor in terms of uh, the economic impact. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. He did mention my long, strange trip of spending 17 years running the Oregon Environmental Council, and I'm in my 18th year at Cascade Policy Institute, which is not your normal career path, I suppose. 
But it does give me some perspective, I think, on these issues, uh, a little bit of seasoning. <coughs> Uh, you might remember in the 1967 movie, The Graduate, uh, Dustin Hoffman is forced to go to a party celebrating his graduation that his parents put on and, and some middle-aged businessman, when they're talking about his future, which he doesn't want to think about, comes up and he says, uh, Benjamin, one word, plastics. <laughs> All right, well, in the context of today's discussion, I, I have one word, Uber. <laughs> so, the, the supposedly hip city of Portland is the only place, a major city on the West Coast, where using the Uber app is illegal because local politicians and their uh, appointed regulators would rather uh, protect the taxi cartel than allow consumers to link up with providers in a completely unsubsidized, privately provided enterprise that's now a $17 billion behemoth that is sweeping aside taxi cartels all over the world, which uh, is a good thing. And I hope, I expect that within two or three years, the Portland taxi cartel will also be swept aside, and that about 10 or 15 years from now, if you tell someone to go out and hail a cab, they'll look at you like my teenage son does when I say, well, why don't you use a pay phone? <laughs> So the Uber issue is symbolic, in my opinion, of everything that's wrong with transportation finance and regulation. So you have local tax regulation is as anachronistic as regulation of the airline routes and pricing was by the Civil Aeronautics Board. And euthanizing the CAB in 1978 enabled the market-based airline revolution the change flying from a boutique experience just for the rich to a low-cost travel option that almost anyone can take advantage of. If we're serious about generating new investment in transportation infrastructure. There are many other agencies and regulatory programs that should get the CAB treatment, including FHWA, FTA, JPAC, TriMet, the Clean Air Act Conformity Rule and the LCDC Transportation Planning Rule, none of which are designed to actually encourage market-based investment. I think the broader implications of the Uber experience are as follows. Contrary to standard political arguments, there are few, if any, uh, quote, market failures in transportation that require government intervention. But ongoing government intervention in the name of solving these imagined problems has led to a massive case of government failure. So we need more private investment, less government taxation, pork barreling, and regulations. And two, there needs to be a tight connection between the price consumers pay and the transportation services they receive. Simply throwing money at a project so that the users perceive it to be free at the point of consumption is a recipe for disaster. Yet that is how most Oregon roads are financed, and to a large extent, transit as well. So if giving services away is your business model, then I think the transportation funding shortage is uh, destined to be permanent. So the discussion of funding is misguided if it's limited to simply a discussion of a possible increase in the federal gas tax versus increase in the state gas tax or various other local and state options. Uh, I was asked to be here to actually defend the uh, devolution case, which I'm happy to do in a much more radical way than uh, people might have thought. And abolishing the federal role would be a small step forward in getting rid of the most egregious pork barrel projects. But it would only be a small step because state and local politicians uh, love the pork barrel money just as much as federal politicians do, and they're very good at it. And the experience is overwhelming in this. I'll just briefly recap that last year, the Portland Auditor, who does a very good job, although she's mostly ignored, uh, issued a report <laughs> entitled simply, Transportation Funding, Revenue Up, Street Maintenance Down. That's all you need to know about the local problem. Metro Auditor, since 2008, she's published at least five reports detailing the failure of Metro to account for money, to actually compare results with uh, plans, to even collect data that one would need to evaluate things. TriMet, 
between 2004 and 2013. Total annual operations revenue at TriMet went up 62%, while annual vehicle miles of actual service went down by 14%. This is a bureaucratic miracle. We transfer vast amounts of resources into the checking accounts of these agencies and never see it again in the form of a new slot book. And here in Portland, we're building two new bridges over the Willamette River, and trucks will be prohibited on both of them. Wow, we're probably the only city in the country that is so hostile to the idea of, of freight transport that we're prohibiting trucks on two modern bridges built in 2014. That's not a market failure problem. That's a government failure problem. So the solution is not just more money, the solution is a massive dose of Uber, whereby markets serve people, not politicians, and the profit motive uh, imposes fiscal discipline. And what is preventing this from happening in transportation is the mindset of government officials in which they want to control the flow of all investment dollars. They want to pick all the projects, set all the prices, and determine how and where people travel. In other words, they insist that we regulate all surface transportation modes in the same failed way that the CAB used to set prices and routes for airline travel. So the uberization of the transportation economy would involve, in my opinion, at least the following six uh, components. One, allowing and encouraging bridges and limited access highways to be converted to uh, tollways, with electronic uh, toll devices. Uh, because if you're talking about where we get the money for travel, you don't have to look around. It's users. Users benefit. Users should pay. And users should pay in, in real time with variable pricing. Because, especially being in those areas that have a, urban congestion. And the gas tax cannot solve that problem because regardless of where the gas tax comes from, federal or state, regardless of its level, it's fixed, it's hidden, it's not visible to the user. So if you pay a massive gas tax at 10 o'clock at night, at 6 o'clock the next day in the morning, you have the exact same incentive as everyone else to get up and overuse of roads and cause congestion. Because the gas tax is fixed, but congestion is very specific to time of day, day of week, location, and direction of travel. It's no mystery that this can be done, by the way. The uh, <clears throat> Oklahoma Turnpike Authority has been electronically tolled from border to border since 1990. So this is not really cutting edge. Uh, restricting the use of toll revenues to the maintenance and expansion of those tollways. If you, I've given lots of speeches on this to audiences, political and uh, political audiences, liberal, conservative, libertarian. I take a lot of heat for it, but uh, in my experience, if you want audience support from toll payers, you you only have a slight chance of getting it if you insist that you will not use them as ATMs for a bunch of uh, uh, pork barreling to non-road modes. If you're going to do this, the, the toll money has to go to the uh, maintenance and expansion, yes, expansion of those facilities. Three, allowing and encouraging private companies to build new highways and bridges with private equity financed through electronic tolls without excessive regulation. That's a key point here. Now, to say, uh, if you hypothetically, if someone came in to JPAC with a proposal for a third, fourth, or fifth bridge over the Columbia entirely privately financed, no public subsidies, what kind of reaction do you think they would get? Well, if you ever had the misfortune of attending a few hundred JPEG meetings, as I've had, <laughs> you, you know the answer. They won't get the permits. It's not just about money. There's an attitude adjustment problem here. Uh, four, deregulating the entire transportation market to allow and encourage competition to try and the streetcar, the taxi cartel, PDOT, and ODOT. Five, devolving all decisions away from the federal government uh, and converting the existing 18.4 .4 cent federal gas tax to just an add-on to the state gas tax, which instead of being 30 cents, it would be 48.4 cents. I'm fine with that. And last, creating real markets and transportation infrastructure and returning consumer sovereignty, whereby consumers get all the transportation choices they want as long as they're willing to pay for them. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well said and helpful. Uh, and next, we're.
sliding to some panel discussions, and I think we start uh, with uh, Randy Miller, our professional full-time citizen, uh, who's uh, managed to uh, slip away from his uh, 37 boards and commissions that he's on to join us here today to preside over the next panel. Randy, thank you very, very much. So when Andrew and I were talking about whether or not I should introduce the panelists up here at the podium or sit down with the speakers, and I thought, what the hell, at my size, it doesn't make any difference. So I'm gonna stand up here for a while and I'm gonna introduce them and make some remarks. And well, yeah, old joke, really old joke. <laughs> we certainly don't have to try to convince any of you out here about the importance of commerce and also how, of course, transportation infrastructure has an essential and critical part of transportation issues as well, of course, as prosperity for the entire region. So now we're gonna hear from some organizations that really depend upon it, really depend upon infrastructure, transportation, because it's critical to their organizations. So first we're gonna hear from Deborah Dunn, who's the president and CEO of the Oregon Trucking Association and the subsidiaries, which for over 60 years has promoted and protected the interests of trucking. And also, uh, she, of course, is very important in terms of their agenda, the legislature, governmental agencies, and the courts. And as the primary representative of OTA, Deborah serves on a number of local, state, national committees that drive transportation policy development, adding a much needed voice for freight, mobility, and infrastructure instrument uh, investment. Currently, she's the chair of the Portland Freight Committee, serves on the Oregon Freight Advisory Committee, and the chair of the Western States and Trucking Executive Council. And then next to her and next will be Marie Dodds, who's the Director of Government and Public Affairs for AAA Oregon, Idaho. Disclosure, I'm on that board. And actually, you know, taking a look at you two, we've got a, our own little U.S. Chamber of Commerce, AFL-CIO, going here between you, don't we? It's not always been the best relationship between the organizations, but boy, we find a lot of common ground now. Marie directs the club's efforts to help uh, AAA Oregon and Idaho achieve its goals of improving mobility and enhancing, of course, the safety of the traveling public. We also had Ted Onlin next, who was the owner of that for quite a while and CEO of F.E. Ward Construction Company and is now the area manager for Sunt Construction and has been very active with the Association of General Contractors both in leadership positions at the state level and at the U.S. level and currently a project manager for the Southern Bridge, which for all hardly wait until all that gets done. So let me just give you a little perspective that's kind of why I'm here, but I think I'm here anyway. Uh, being involved with all this stuff for a long time. Um, first of all, for 30 years I ran a business that really depended upon the network because we were not only importing product from overseas, but I was also shipping product in the network all over the United States uh, for my business. I've also been a participant in economic development circles for over 35 years, and obviously economic development, transportation, are uh, key ingredients for prosperity. The users of the network, everybody in here, we all drive cars, but I'm also a daily cyclist, making girls very, very proud. Also uh, an avid runner, you know, of course at 67, not exactly at a torrid pace, but still using the network for all that stuff. As I mentioned, I'm a board member of AAA, so trying to align with Marie's objectives, and also, I've been leading for almost 30 years best practice trips all over the country and internationally. And we look at other communities where their success and failures have been. And it's been so apparent how important this particular discussion is, not just here, but there as well, all over the place. And having similar discussions is how we can get around it. And also, with a few others in the room, as a member of the steering committee for the Community Investment Initiative, and we were charged a few years ago to take a look at this issue, and not just infrastructure, but some maybe funding models as well, so that we can kind of wrap this all up together in possibly some efforts, along with what Ted Mueller said at the state. So we're all hearing about the funding gap. You've heard certainly all the issues. We know it's a big issue. And of course, to think about even in the metro area where we live, it's in the billions, the funding gap, over the next several years. I mean, it's a huge number. And obviously there's no easy solutions, but have you noticed, even in the last year, the traffic congestion, how much worse it's gotten just in one year? And I know that means economic prosperity, and that's a good thing for the community. But this year, Portland's passing the 600,000 mark. This, the metro area is almost at 2.5 million. 
So you know, this isn't going to get any better, and obviously unless we resolve this. And on these best practice trips, the thing we hear over and over again is the cachet of Portland. Everybody wants to come here, which is a good reason in a lot of respects and why we have in the traffic. But it is amazing when we go everywhere how everybody says, you are the model, we want to move to Portland. So we know it's going to be a, a, a big of a challenge. A lot of the discussions have been talked about federal and the importance of federal. That's why, of course, one of the big reasons he pulls us together. But I'm also concerned about locally and how we can stay competitive. The region needs to be competitive with infrastructure against others that maybe are more innovative than we that we're thinking. I mean, Bill White competes somewhat in that big bad Los Angeles for the port. Well, they're undergoing a massive investment locally and with their transportation corridors around it. So it's just for the Portland region to be competitive, not only to create jobs, but for prosperity for all of us, get this state income, you know, per capita income, up at least to the average, like we're all trying to shoot for. It's all built in together. So these guys have a big challenge, of course, with this, and we're going to hear how it affects them. And then maybe we'll also tease out a couple other ideas that maybe they possibly have. So Deborah, you want to just, there's a, actually, there's a mic right there. Well, first. Hello. Yes. First, I want to thank uh, Congressman Blumenauer for inviting uh, an Oregon trucking representative. You know, I was really hoping that there might be a trucking company setting up here today as opposed to me, because I really believe that if you could hear and uh, really experience what they do every day, uh, traveling not just Oregon's highways, but in most states across the country, you know, I think that would have been a terrific story. So instead, I'm going to bring you some of those comments that they shared with me every time I called one of them and they said, no, Deborah, I'm sorry, I can't make it. So first I want you to know uh, that in the U.S., uh, there are almost 1.4 million trucking companies. We travel 397 billion miles per year, and that's in all 50 states. In 2012, we hauled 9.4 billion tons of freight. Now closer to home, so you can just get a little sense, uh, we have approximately 8,000 trucking companies operating in the state of Oregon. And in the downturn, I want you to know that we were down to almost 6,000. So we are coming back, and we're coming back slowly, which is very, which is, which is good for the state. We have about 275,000 trucks that operate not just in Oregon, but through Oregon. You know, our vision is not just the state's four borders. It clearly is the U.S. because most of our companies travel in the majority of those states throughout the year. We move here in Oregon 88% of all the manufactured goods, and we travel 5.4 billion miles every year. So it won't be surprising to hear from me that we need safe, reliable, and efficient network, uh, and, and again, across <coughs> this country. Because we need to be able to deliver, here in Oregon, 80% of the communities depend solely on the trucks for the receipt of the goods that they use every day. It's 80%, folks. I mean, I think sometimes we think of, you know, the state of Oregon as the state of Portland and the Portland metro region. And we have 80 communities in the state that really require on our ability to get our goods to their, uh, to their homes. We also deliver many good, most of our goods to our multi multimodal partners, excuse me, our marine partners, our rail partners, and our uh, air partners. We've got FedEx here in the room and UPS. We also deliver to our customers, our grocery stores, and just about any industrial area here in the area or across any part of this country. But as a community, we also need to have the capacity in which to respond in a natural disaster or a weather event. We need to be able to support the communities in digging out and or rebuilding. But today, as Randy mentioned, um, the congestion issue is becoming increasingly difficult for my industry. Uh, right now, we're losing about 104 million hours every year to congestion. It's costing the trucking industry 
upwards of $9 billion a year due to congestion. Lost productivity is putting truck drivers setting 51,000 <coughs> hours every year and they're just stalled, they're not moving. We've got a problem with congestion. So what can we do about it? Well, the Oregon Trucking Association, with our partner, the American Trucking Association, is very supportive of uh, an increase in federal uh, gas and diesel tax. Uh, we also see value in the concept of indexing. Uh, if we had indexed uh, since 1993, our gas tax would be 24 cents as opposed to 18, not much. But think of all those years of those funds towards the investment in our infrastructure. If we had indexed diesel tax in, those, in that same period, be 24 cents is what it is uh, today, be 32 cents. We would like to see those federal dollars, the majority of them, to be directed to highway infrastructure projects building uh, our bridges and securing uh, the, um, those bridges that are experiencing the, the, uh, the, the strain of years of neglect. We'd also like to see those funds be used to take the pressure points off of many of the choke points and bottlenecks that I know many of us drive through every day here in the Portland metro region, but those are in every part of the country. We would be very, very, uh, very, upset to hear that we were going towards a devolution. Um, for an industry that requires us to need a consistent system from one state to another, we would see situations where one state would have a toll, one state would have gas tax, one state would have, I mean, I think we would be creating a patchwork that would be very difficult for an industry such as ours to operate in. Uh, let alone the impact that it would have to our communities. So thank you again for today and letting me share some remarks. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope that most of you know that AAA is who you call when you need roadside assistance. We are the largest organization in the country, in North America, in fact, representing motorists. We have 54 million members in America, the United States, and Canada. We are also the largest travel leisure agency in the North American district. And we have um, millions of people who use our travel services. So obviously, travel and transportation are things that are very important to us and our millions of members. As we've heard already this morning, we did get uh, some progress made last week in dealing with transportation. We got another temporary patch to the Highway Trust Fund. The good news is this bill provides $11 billion in funding for surface transportation programs through May of 2015. Bad news is it decreases hopes for a multi-year transportation funding solution being reached in the near term. So clearly we still have a lot of work to do. Focus now turns to prospects for a 2015 transportation bill and the possibility for including the amendment bill in upcoming debt limit discussions. In the coming months, AAA will continue to advocate for long-term sustainable transportation bills that focus on results, ensures adequate funding, and keeps the safety of our roads and bridges a national priority. In the short term, AAA supports solutions such as Congressman Blumenauer's proposal to increase the federal gas tax by 15 cents per gallon. A gas tax increase would provide the necessary funds to improve our system while also upholding the long-standing principle that those who use the roads should pay for the roads. Increasing the gas tax is deficit neutral and would provide stable funding for the program into the next decade. As we've also heard this morning, we know that the federal gas tax hasn't been raised since 1993. Its purchasing power has been cut in half. 
motorists have to pay about $324 each and every year in additional maintenance and repair expenses because of the poor quality of our roads and bridges. And that figure comes from the American Society of Civil Engineers. There are all kinds of alternatives to a gas tax. And of course, here in Oregon, uh, we are pioneers in a VMT. Uh, other ideas include public road partnerships, alternative fuel taxes, sales taxes, funding transportation from the general fund, et cetera. AAA certainly supports the notion of a VMT, but as we all know, there are still many concerns about privacy and demographic effects. So in short, a VMT is not yet ready for prime time. Doing nothing is not the answer. As it is now, Americans endure frustrating commutes and unsafe road conditions because our political leaders, with the exception of Congressman Blumenauer, have not demonstrated the political will necessary to fund current, let alone future, transportation needs. It's time that our leaders in Washington, D.C. stop the hand-wringing and start taking real steps to shore up funding for our roads and bridges that we rely on every day. And of course, doing nothing only kicks the can down the road for our kids, grandkids, and great-grandchildren. Devolution is also an option that AAA does not support. We have an interstate system, not an intrastate system, and this system should be seamless in its approach. Our economy depends on a high-quality surface system for cars and trucks. Shifting the burden to the states creates a patchwork system. As Deborah mentioned, some states have tolls, some state gas taxes, some a combination that would negatively impact the flow of commerce. Continuing to put off tough decisions about how to fund transportation will risk road safety and compromise our economic vitality. But the fault isn't just with lawmakers. There's plenty of blame to go around. Truth is, all of us have done a poor job of mobilizing support for what we know needs to happen. AAA believes there are five things we need to do to address this issue. Number one, establish a concerted coalition effort to construct a plan of action that focuses on not just what is needed, but what is possible. Two, agree on acceptable transportation funding mechanisms and articulate clear guidelines to ensure proper use of those funds. Three, educate voters on why the increase in funding is required. Public support is likely the most important ingredient for building stronger backbones in Congress. Four, broaden our focus to include both federal and state opportunities to fund transportation. And five, make sure that we properly resource the effort. We need to make sure that we don't try to move forward without fully understanding and committing all of the resources that are necessary. Without a safe and efficient transportation network, goods can't be delivered cost effectively, family trips take longer, and gridlock will continue to stifle our nation's long-term economic recovery. Thank you to Congressman Blumenauer for organizing this very important summit today, and we look forward to working together to solve some of these problems. Thank you very much. I'm Ted Otlin. I'm a contractor. I'm the guy who goes out and builds the bridges and the highways that we all drive on. I think the case has been well made for the needs and why we need a great infrastructure system, what it's done for this country. And this country has basically been built based on our highway system. We've been able to manufacture in Yakima, Washington, and transport our goods to ship out in Oregon because of the good roads and the inexpense that we're able to do it by. So our country has prospered throughout the country because of the great highway system we have. We can live and work in other communities. We're not forced to live around our port cities as other countries do. So our system, we know it's needed. We know we gotta have it. And now we have to talk about what effect it has on those of us who are in the industry, the contractors. We work with the DOTs, the counties, the cities, and we look into the future for the projects 
that are need to be built and what's going to be built. And of course, the first thing we have to look at is what finances are available so those facilities can be built. We look out there and we watch the dollars, we see what's going to happen. And when we don't have the six-year plan that we've had in the past, when that six-year plan disappears, and it's a patchwork of Congress adding a little money here and a little money there to keep us going, we look out and we don't have the certainty of where we're going to be in the future. Now, it's not just contractors, the design firms are also in this where they're looking. So what we do is we don't hire those young, bright people coming out of school. We're not training our workforce adequately because we don't know if we're going to have the jobs for them to be there. There's an effect with our suppliers, our concrete, our wood, all the things, the steel that goes into our projects where nobody's willing to put out on the hope that there's going to be funding. We just look at what's there, what we can rely on, and we work based on that. Bigger companies have it maybe a little bit easier. Smaller companies suffer more because they don't have the working capital. They don't have the funds to go out and do some of the things they need to do to grow when they see a market that there's no growth in. So we really affect the talent that we have in the industry when we don't have the dollars that reach out far enough that we can see that there is a market out there for us to work in. It affects the quality of our work, the professionalism, the things we do. And we work as partners with federal government, DOTs. Um, I've chaired the quality and construction on the federal level. I've been involved with uh, ODOT. We started a constructability review to look at projects as they were coming out, bringing the contractors in and talking about the building, how do we do it better, faster, cheaper, with the highest possibly possible quality. All of those things don't work well if the funding isn't there that we can see. Now, I was president of AGC of America, and I traveled the country, and I spoke to many groups about this. And I would reach out and ask Congressman Blumenhauer to go with me. Now, he would <laughs> always agree to go. I took him to Florida, Washington, D.C., to California, to many venues. And he's the one guy who always got up in front, spoke his mind, told the truth, spoke where we need to go and what we had to do, and, and always wound up with a standing ovation for his vision and what he's doing. What we have to do is get that vision out to more people. We have to get people to thoroughly understand how important our infrastructure is and what a great deal it is. I mean, our highways and freeways are the greatest deal going. I drove a little over 20 miles to get to this meeting this morning. Our highways cost between four million and 20 million a mile to construct, depending on the landscape of what we're building in. So for me to come from my home to here, I drove on infrastructure that cost from 150 million to 200 million dollars. That was the value of what I drove on, and it cost me less than 50 cents to drive on. Now, there's not a better deal anywhere, any place. And what we have to do is explain to the public, because the public that's out there today has always had the freeways and the highways. They didn't grow with us changing and building them. They've always been there and they take them for granted. But if they realize the great value they have and what they're getting for the dollars, I think they would understand that a five cent raise in tax, a 15 cent raise in the gas tax is nothing compared to the value that they're really getting out there. So please stand up, let people know, advocate, let our leaders in Congress know that this is a really important issue. It's not just about contractors building or designers designing, it's about the American way of life and what we're doing. And this is one of the things that we need to really stand behind, both parties, every American out here, to keep our country great.
Thank you very much. A mini solution to the problem kind of aligns with Marie at AAA, and that is if you're a cyclist and you're a AAA member in Oregon, we'll pick you up and take you home. Only safe to do this. Very nice. You know, one thing too, besides the fact that, uh, that I noticed about these presentations, besides the fact that all three certainly align with Earl's mission and also uh, his approach, is that all three of you are involved and have been involved in national organizations. Uh, not just local, but that would incorporate the entire country, obviously. And I'm wondering whether or not the, your organizations are mobilizing nationally through those organizations to try to create what you're looking for because every state has the same issue. So if you'd like to comment to that, what's happening, and even more so, can the three different approaches combine for one mega approach to the Congress? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with the American, the American Trucking Association is our national affiliate, and they work on Capitol Hill regularly with uh, Congressman Blumenauer. I know that just recently I was with 42 of my counterparts around the country in New Hampshire, where we talked about this very thing. And I can tell you that Oregon is ahead of the game uh, when you look at it from a state to state, uh, on a state to state basis. But as far as nationally, uh, there's not a state that you that I work with that is not working with their congressional delegation to, um, you know, to advocate on behalf of some kind of funding mechanism. Whether it, we're all a little concerned about the temporary fix, as opposed to some long-term uh, decisions that need to be made, and we basically kicked it down the down the uh, road for yeah. a while. And we also are national in scope. Uh, we have um, 54 million members uh, across the country. And last week, of course, uh, was a week that AAA was in action. Congressman Blumenauer's office was one that we contacted. Uh, we contacted our entire congressional delegation uh, in a advance of the votes last week. We have a AAA office in Washington, D.C. that's very busy, and I would say that um, of course, transportation funding has always been an important issue for AAA, but with the gridlock that we've seen in Washington, D.C. the last several years, the issue is certainly more important to us now, and uh, we will continue to act in a nationwide manner to hopefully get a long-term stable funding. And of course, we know that's not going to be easy with the political climate today, but um, AAA has really mobilized its resources and is focused on this, and we need to find a solution for all of the reasons that we've discussed today. AGC of Oregon and AGC of America both walk the halls of Congress to ensure that the message is out there, that we're working hard to see that we get our funding, that it's adequate funding, and educate our lawmakers on what the real needs are and what the dangers are if we don't get them taken care of. So we work at it daily. Uh, we've got some great folks up there that are uh, well informed and are, are great teachers for what our needs are. In addition to staff and lobbyists, are you mobilizing your members to work on your own on their own states? Yes. You are. That's great. There's been um, the issue of potentially tolling interstates, which is now prohibited by law, except for very uh, limited exceptions. Would all three of you support that, do you think? You know, AAA's position on tolling historically has been that uh, we oppose tolling on existing structures, but that we support it um, if necessary for a new construction. But I think we would probably be willing to look at it in, in some other fashion. I know that we would uh, align with AAA when it comes to um, tolling to build new infrastructure. Uh, to toll on existing infrastructure has been uh, a position that we've had for a number of years that we would be opposed to. And part of the problem is the media campaign that's going on on the East Coast. Because the tolling and the, uh, that is occurring in most states back there 
uh, there's a real perception that the funds are not being used appropriately and there's just some bad media on the East Coast and I think that really has played a big role in driving policy at least on this coastline. Do you, do you, go ahead, Ted. Well, AGC uh, believes that there is a need for tolling on certain structures. Uh, personally, I think tolling is a cop out for Congress not doing their job and that uh, only in special places should tolling be used. We need to stand up, have all Americans pay for their share of using the highways, and we take care of it that way. Are we bringing in the environmental community too in these discussions and try to obtain some support as we move forward with ideas and initiatives, not just local but also national? Do we know? Well, in the construction world, the environmental uh, part of it is very big. Uh, we're into it every day and every design that goes out and every job that goes on, we have a tremendous amount of environmental regulations that we deal with. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know here in Oregon we do a very good job of working with our environmental partners on how we can resolve uh, the issues that uh, we're all facing when it comes to transportation development. On the federal level, I can't say that American Trucking Association maybe does as much of that. That doesn't mean they don't have those conversations, but I think Oregon is doing a very good job of uh, working together and, and trying to solve the problems together. Likewise, we have a very good partnership, I think. And, and of course, AAA is made up of, of citizens. We have 750,000 members in Oregon and Idaho, and let's face it, we care about the environment here. So in order for our organization to uh, continue to survive and thrive, we have to care about it too. We want to. Good. Well, I think that it sounds like we're all basically in agreement on most everything, and also that your organizations are working very well together, both locally and nationally, which I think is, is absolutely terrific. Um, any concluding remarks you'd like to make, any of you relative to what you see as maybe some input for Earl or other local leaders, which they could take back to their forums to discuss before we break? I'm trying to get us out on time. Uh, just quickly, um, any opportunity I have to share with any audience about the condition of the trucking industry, I take it. And this is my opportunity. Uh, over the last five years, uh, the trucking industry has been uh, overwhelmed with a series of new regulatory requirements that are costing them in their productivity anywhere between four and 14%. And when you think about adding all of these other factors in the cost in which they um, have to absorb in their day-to-day -day businesses is quite difficult. So thinking about an increase of anything, uh, you know, they get this visceral reaction to that. You know, it's just one more um, uh, cost associated with it. However, we don't have rail, we don't have the air, and we can't travel on uh, the uh, waterways yet. So we do need to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, I just encourage us to do it in a thoughtful way and in a way that will, um, you know, really be targeted towards the areas that will get us the most benefit. Um, and again, we just truly really want to work together in, in trying to resolve the problems. Three words for you, long-term sustainable funding. <laughs> I think the way we make change is we stand up as one voice and we talk. So I would just encourage all of you to speak up, write, let people know what your stand is, and uh, be very public about it. Thank you. Great. Thanks to everybody on the panel. Thank you, Randy. And I will say that uh, it's, it's fascinating for me to watch the partnership that has emerged between uh, AAA and the truckers, uh, which occasionally have had some modest differences, um, but have really been resolute. Uh, Bill Graves, the president of the American Trucking Association, former governor of uh, Kansas, has been one of the most outspoken, focused, tireless champions who talked about how as a governor he raised the gas tax and the sun didn't stop uh, going across the sky. Uh, AAA, 
uh, has done superb research, uh, survey research recently talking about public attitudes relative to how to fund transportation. Fascinating. Uh, more than two-thirds of the public believes that we need to be investing in infrastructure, almost the same percentage, thinks it ought to be a user fee, and a majority of Americans say they would pay more. So it's not always easy to advocate for, uh, when your members, uh, Deborah, um, as, you, uh, as you point out, um, uh, have some challenges, as do motorists. Uh, gas tax is not the most popular, but having responsible national organizations focus on what's the best long-term interest has really been, uh, uh, for me, it has been really inspirational uh, watching that as part of this partnership. And uh, Ted, uh, AGC has been there with money, chalk, and marbles. Uh, you should know that uh, this, is, this is being filmed. Um, what, part of what we're doing here today will be on cable access, but part of it is developing a model that could be used in other parts of the country. Because there are groups and organizations that are interested in the same conversation. We're looking for something that can be exported to Florida or to Massachusetts or Wyoming, uh, where there's a way to tap in to the vast networks that are aligning on investing in our future. And so you're helping here today uh, with a, what might be a little pilot on our own. Uh, and it's why when we get to the question and comment, we're going to ask people to use a microphone so the viewers at home will not uh, miss uh, your moment of brilliance. Um, but speaking of moments of brilliance, uh, we're now going to uh, turn to uh, uh, Andre Ba. Andre, there you are. Um, had the privilege of working with Andre, uh, Andre for uh, years at the city of Portland. Uh, he was uh, in our transportation engineering. He helped us uh, with uh, some work on street standards, cheap and skinny streets, ways of doing things differently uh, with design, with process. Uh, he's carried that forward in terms of his own private practice and uh, finding time to squeeze in uh, uh, some service on the Planning Commission, among others. We really appreciate uh, having you here and uh, taking us to our next panel. Um, I am pleased to have the leadership uh, that we have today on this panel. Um, part of my role is chair of the Planning Sustainability Commission for the City of Portland. And as that role, we're currently embarked on the comprehensive plan, the first plan in over 20, 25 years that's looking out to 2035. And as part of that, um, I encourage you to take a look at that plan. Transportation is a fundamental part of the growth of not only the city of Portland, but the county and the region, including Vancouver, and the state of Oregon of how, you know, what, what is that foundation and how is that going to look in the future? And uh, someone mentioned the legacy. Um, so I'm really honored today with our distinguished panelists, um, Mayor of the City of Portland, Charlie Hales, um, the Chair of Multnomah County, Deborah Kofori, and City of uh, Vancouver Councilor um, Jack Berkman. Um, these are the leaders at the ground level that really are going to make the decisions about our transportation needs. Um, I'm not sure about the crooks and all that, but the, the bridges in, in the county, um, the, the city streets in the city of Vancouver and in Portland, and the connections of all of those, how they work, and clearly there has to be a good connection and cooperation between these three entities for us to have what um, clearly the private sector said they need consistency they need an expectation of what it's going to look like in the future for them to make their investments so i'd like to start with each of uh, them giving us their initial thoughts on this issue of transportation and looking into the future Charlie. Well, let me do a couple of things. First, uh, set the context a little bit. Secondly, talk about Portland's particular situation. And third, get to very specifics uh, about where we think we need to go, what we need to do next. Uh, first, to context, um, 
actually, devolution from the federal government to local government is not a new problem or a new concept, as, of course, Congressman Blumenauer knows very well. Um, we used to have federal financial capital support for water and sewer projects. That went away, unfortunately, just before he exercised the kind of courageous leadership that he is now on this issue, when he exercised it on the mandate to sewer what was then mid Multnomah County, which we had to do with our own resources by charging people ratepayer dollars to carry out an environmental mandate to sewer an area that had 65,000 households and businesses on cesspools. By the way, that's why Portland annexed what's now East Portland, not Avarice, in case you've been reading you know, delusional local newspaper stories that are off on a different tangent. You know, it was a big financial liability that Portland and Gresham were required to shoulder, and both cities had to sewer the area. And we didn't get any federal help because the, the, the federal grants that used to come to those kinds of projects had gone away. Then uh, another along came the Superfund mandate, which when President Carter signed the law included a tax on polluters that fueled, that funded the super fund. Now it is neither fun nor funded. In fact, it, the Newt Gingrich and that Congress repealed the tax on polluters that funded the super fund. It then crashed financially in 2004 and is now an unfunded mandate called the super fund that contains no money. We are now dealing with implementing that uh, piece of devolution. In housing, the federal government used to fund more of what they fund through HUD. There's still some flow of community development block grant dollars and other federal capital resources to local governments, but the city of Portland spends tens of millions of dollars a year, as does Multnomah County, on funding housing and homeless services that used to be more generously supported by federal expenditure. Uh, and then transportation, we know that if the 1993 Congress, uh, which unfortunately Congressman Blumenauer hadn't arrived just in time to get him to do it right that time. If they had simply indexed the four cent increase that got us to 18.4 cents in 1993, if they just indexed it, it would be at 30 cents a year now instead of 18.4 cents. So the legislation that he's proposing now is a catch up to what Congress should have done. So there's a broad pattern here of the federal government receding from its longer term commitments and local governments and state governments having to shoulder the burden. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try at the federal level. And I com totally commend what you're proposing, Congressman, and we all should, as Ted said and others, step up, support you vocally and, and uh, passionately because this is the right thing to do. Now, meanwhile, Portland's situation at the moment is that uh, that we are actually in a place of great strength, that the combination of functionality and quality of place and cost here is causing this city to grow and prosper in a very sustainable way. We have infrastructure challenges, some of the ones I just mentioned, and transportation, but we are booming today, and I'm happy about it, and it's a, a good time to be in leadership because it's better to preside over the problems of growth and expansion than the other kind. Uh, in fact, just a vignette, yesterday I met a, a young business person I hadn't met before, his name is Ben Jacobson, he owns a salt company called Jacobson Salt. Started as a one person operation, evaporating seawater from Neatarts Bay and processing it into gourmet salt here in Portland. He now has 20 employees, he's in the central east side, Randy. Uh, just one more example of how quality play of place, the functionality of our transportation system, that salt has to get to Portland from Neatarts Bay, um, and get somewhere else, usually by air freight, uh, to vendors around the country and around the world. Uh, so he's just one more indication of how we're on a roll successfully here. But we are in a competitive environment, not only with cities like Shanghai, and I don't have to further illuminate the difference between what's going on in infrastructure investment in this country versus uh, other countries, but we're also in a competition for quality of place, functionality, and cost with other metro areas in the United States. And frankly, they're being more aggressive than we are, mostly because they make use of the tool of a local sales tax. Salt Lake City, a conservative uh, metropolitan area, is embarked on a massive expansion of their transit system funded by a local sales tax. Minneapolis, Dallas, Los Angeles. We used to make fun of Los Angeles. 
uh, as a dysfunctional place from a transportation standpoint. How many of you were at the reception, I know some of you were, at the Railvolution Conference in LA Union Station in 2004? Daughter, I know you were there. And then some of you were there again in 2012. What was the difference in the activity level in LA Union Station? In 2004, it was a beautifully preserved old mission-style building with a few Amtrak trains rumbling through each day. In 2012, it is the site of 60,000 transit boardings a day. 60,000. LA Metro has embarked on a 30-year transit expansion program that they're carrying out in 10 years. That's why they call it the 3010 program, funded by, you guessed it, a half cent local sales tax. Oregonians' cussed resistance to this easy way to pay for capital infrastructure means, in this case, that other metropolitan areas are outpacing us in their investments in quality of life. And that's a problem that we need to grapple with as well. But while we're waiting for a carbon tax or a VMT fee or tolling ideas like John Charles talked about or uh, Oregonians to finally put on our big boy and big girl pants and adopt a sales tax, we need to act locally. And both Commissioner Novick and I are pleased to be on the program today to talk about that. Uh, because we have looked at our situation, as has our city auditor, and that same audit that John mentioned also said we need to be spending $75 million more a year just to maintain the streets that we have in the city of Portland, <coughs> most of which were built by developers in the early 1900s. I live on a street that was built in 1930 by a developer and then deeded over to the city. The Ogden streets are a little younger than that. So Portland has a, an aging infrastructure problem at the neighborhood level that is more acute than most of the rest of the metropolitan area. And because of all this anemia in our funding systems, we need to invest now in order to preserve that asset, which has already gotten too far down the curve of where it costs much, much more to repair than to maintain. Um, and we've looked at a number of options, and you'll, again, you'll hear from my colleague about this more, and we've concluded that a local transportation utility fee, like 28 other cities in Oregon have moved to, is probably the best way to do this. I think it's safe to say that both Commissioner Novick and I and the third member of the Portland City Council who are prepared to vote for this are all fairly agnostic about exactly what mechanism we need to adopt in order to produce about $50 million more a year in local revenue. But the one that we want to move forward with is the one that we can do. And this one appears to be probably the most viable, uh, although each of them comes with problems and side effects that are unlovely. But if you look at our competitiveness as a city, and if you look at our responsibility for stewardship of that multi-billion dollar local asset that we own, and if you are realistic in looking at this long-term pattern of devolution, you, I think, must reach the same conclusion that we've reached, and that is we have to act locally. It is the right and responsible, though not completely popular, thing to do. What can each of you do? Just what Ted Adwin suggested. In three months, when the Portland City Council takes up this issue, come to the hearing. Say so. Say that you believe that this is the right thing to do. Support this. This will not be easy for the members of the Portland City Council who will have to make this decision. We have to deal with both the backlash of folks that wish that something like this could be free um, and, um, and the jeering of at least some in the local media who don't seem to have a better idea. So we need your help politically to get this done. I believe we will do it. I believe we will hold those three votes to take action. But it's what we have to do now. We have to do with what we can, with what we have, where we are, while we wait for some of these larger changes to come together. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, and um, that's, um, I'm honored to be here today, and since uh, the mayor took all of my time to talk. I'm just going to pass it <laughs> 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 A little humor is always good. 
Uh, no, thank you for having the county here today, Multnomah County. I also want to call out my um, colleague, Commissioner Loretta Smith, who is here, and the wonderful county transportation staff, very small but mighty team. Um, Multnomah County has an interesting role in transportation. We have um, a limited number of, of roads, uh, about 300 miles of roads, but our, so the biggest thing that we have to handle and is to operate, manage and maintain the six Willamette River bridges and then over 20 smaller bridges throughout Multnomah County. Um, and we have to work to keep these assets safe and preserve the historic bridges. Uh, you probably know two of our downtown bridges are over 100 years old, so we at Multnomah County take very um, important the reduce, reuse, recycle ethic that we have here in maintaining these 130-year-old bridges. Um, federal funding to maintain our bridges is crucial. But we have had to, as the mayor talked about, in recent years, look locally to, to continue to keep these bridges operating. In fact, in the last seven years, we've had to replace two of our bridges. And the Selwood Bridge Project, which is the one that I have been most um, intimately involved with, which is the single largest capital construction project the county has ever undertaken, is being built with 70% local funding. Um, the project is a partnership with the city of Portland, the state, and the federal government through the Tiger Three grant, but as I said, 70% of those dollars are locally um, raised. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Selwood, since it's um, something near and dear to my heart, about how we were able to get uh, funding for this bridge project in this time of um, austerity. First, I think we did a great job of communicating the need, and um, it's really important if you're going out and asking um, the taxpayers to contribute, they need to know what their dollars are funding. And I think um, we did a really good job throughout the years before I got to the county of letting the, the people know exactly what was happening with the Selwood by um, closing it to um, transit and closing it to um, putting a weight limit on it. We showed folks that really the bridge was not um, stable for high um, heavy weight vehicles and it was only a matter of time before we would have to close it all together. Um, second, uh, we were creative. We used the CMGC model the first time we used this um, at Multnomah County, and that allowed us to do some really creative things like moving the deck of the bridge um, and say, building piers and then moving the deck over to, to be used while we're constructing um, the, the current bridge. So those kind of techniques we wouldn't have come up with had we not used the CMGC model. Third, um, in seeking funds for this bridge, um, we were collaborative. I think there was no one in this room who I didn't shake down uh, for every nickel and dime. And by, uh, we, couldn't, we wouldn't be here today uh, halfway through construction were it not for our partnership with the city, um, with the state, and of course, um, thank you to Congressman Blumenauer for his help in getting the Tiger Three grant, which closed um, the gap from our other partners who uh, stepped away from the table. No names. Um, and then, uh, fourth, uh, we were innovated. innovative. We're building the Selwood Bridge for the future. It is multimodal, has the largest um, bike and pedestrian, um, larger than any of our other bridges, and um, so we're building a bridge for the future. Fifth, being flexible. The first time out with our Tiger Grant, we didn't get it. So we worked harder. We did a much, much better job the second time around. We worked even more closely with our federal partners and were lucky enough to get $17.7 .7 million. And last, we were lucky. Um, it was really uh, serendipity that at the time when we were out looking for funding, the legislature was putting together the Jobs and Transportation Act in 2009. And through the partnership with um, Senator Bruce Starr and many others in the um, Oregon legislature, we were able to get the funding necessary to, um, and the ability to have the vehicle um, registration fee to fund the project. So looking at a future without federal funding is not something that we want to do, but we know that um, we have the ability to go local and to look locally to, to fund our needs, but it's so, it, it, it is such a much better world when we look forward and we see a great partnership with the federal government. So um, we look forward to a future with more and not less funding from the federal government and in whatever ways that we at Multnomah County can be a partner with you and help, um, we are here to do that. Thank you.
Gee, I have all these great little comments I kept scribbling down here as you two were talking. <laughs> Um, well, so good morning and thank you for inviting me here to participate. Um, we really do appreciate the opportunity to participate in these discussions because Vancouver and Clark County are absolutely core parts of the Portland-Vancouver metropolitan area. Um, we're still growing those relationships in many different cases. Um, as you read the press and such, you're going to find we're having a few struggles on our side of the river. There are some differences of opinion. We're a growing area that ranges from very rural to uh, becoming metropolitan by many standards. But wait a minute, I might have just described Clackamas and Portland too. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a commonality between us. But no matter what happens, our transportation system is intimately linked. That's freight, commuters, transit, bicycles. Everything we're doing is aimed at pulling all this together because we want that fully interconnected system. But even though we have that goal, it's becoming more challenging to make those investments. And we can talk about the 20th century, how our nation embarked on a program to build an interstate system. Well, that's behind us. We have some maintenance and preservation to do in a lot of that. Now it's about building out that system throughout our counties, our cities, and our towns. Um, Vancouver's taken a lot of st uh, steps to improve our transportation choices. We're, we're a growing area, and, and we take that seriously. You know, we're working on bikeways, uh, a lot of pedestrian. We're really making livability a focus. We're focusing on our waterfront development in downtown, urbanizing as we build that. We're using modern techniques as it relates to transportation. But congestion is becoming a growing problem, and it's only going to get worse if we don't keep up with the growth. And that can be our I-5 or 205 bridges. Um, it can be the overcapacity of our interchanges, our congested streets. Uh, everybody knows what happens if we have a significant fender bender on one of our major arterials. You know, we kind of lock it up for that rush hour and it's hard to get it cleared before the rush hour is over. So we take the perspective that to address our local needs, we do need the assistance of the federal government to provide more tools uh, and, and um, local programs that help fund these municipal transportation projects. When the earmarks went away, we lost a lot of opportunity. Right now, most of the federal money is going to the state DOT from formula funds. And that's great, but it's, a lot of it stops right there. In the state of Washington, um, they steer so much money to the maintenance programs, the very little makes it down to the local area. Uh, so that's why we support increasing the size of the surface transportation program and the transportation alternatives program, because both programs give more local control over federal funds, but you know, realistically, they've been pretty flatlined over the years, and so purchasing power is just eroding the ability to use those funds. We also support providing a larger percentage of the TAP funds to local governments, because that's a case of uh, enhancement money going directly to the local government. And today, about 50% of that money is diverted to the state DOT, and there's about a third less money in the program. So you see I keep painting these pictures of less resources that are making it all the way down. Uh, the bipartisan Senate proposal, two-thirds of that TAP money would go to a local government. Those are the kind of directions that we need to start seeing to kind of balance this out. Now, one of the themes that's part of the discussion today is to look at state and local jurisdictions and how they make investments. And I want to take a moment and highlight some of the differences between how Oregon makes investments and Washington does, because I find a lot of people uh, don't quite see it that way, even though we're a combined metro area, we have some pretty stark differences. For example, uh, while many of the Oregon's projects are funded by ODOT, by funds that are allocated by the legislature, our legislature chooses virtually every program. In the last gas tax increase, I believe it was one cent out of nine cents went to the local government. Eight cents stayed at the, at the state level, and 100% of the projects were defined, allocated, and scheduled by the legislature and handed off to DOT to implement. The previous gas tax of five cents, none went to the local. That's a challenging environment for local governments. Um, we have increased our gas tax twice, uh, but as I said, that's not making it local. So that's a local problem, but I'm not gonna say we have, we don't have a share of problems at the state. I'm, I'm not intending to whine, I'm trying to paint a picture of when we talk about De uh, devolution that where do we draw from? How many of you have heard about the McCleary verdict? Okay, now if I ask that in Washington, I will get a very different response. The Washington State Constitution has an interesting statement in it. It says, quote, it is the paramount duty of the state, paramount, to make ample provision 
for the education of all children residing within its borders. Okay. A suit was initiated in 2012 and the state Supreme Court ruled, we're not doing that. Fix it. If you have a fiscal crisis, it doesn't make any difference. You either fund it or change the Constitution. So what that means is we are now running between three and four billion dollars per biennium behind in the investments we have to make in general education. Washington State General Fund is about 15 billion dollars. So take that backdrop and ask for some more money for roads. It's, it's a bit challenging. The, so let's push it down to the local level. If we want to increase our property tax collections, we have a different system. Ours is not directly assessed based. Ours is budget based. We have a voter initiative that says local jurisdictions may collect no more than 1% increase in property tax year over year, except for new construction. Regardless of property values, everybody's house can double in value. Inflation can be 15%. We may have up to 1% more. And if you want to change that, if you want to pass a tax for local bonding, it takes 60% vote. And you have to have a turnout of 40% of the voters who voted in the last general election. This is the environment that we operate within. So when you look at that, and then you look at things like Map 21 that said, we're now going to place your local arterials on the national highway system, basically federalizing them. So if you get federal money, now you've got to build your arterials to federal systems, federal standards that raises the complexity. So you're, you're hearing a plea here, bring down the complexity, bring more money directly into the local area. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say cut the red tape because that's not what it's about. Performance measures are great, but if you're gonna do that, fund them. Now again, I, I set, share this picture because it sets that environment. And I'm gonna say it again, I don't know how um, devolution works in that kind of environment. Because what it means is we have to rewire our state. We have to rewire our cities. We can do that, but I'm not sure that's the most viable way of doing it. You know, our local economies and our quality of life are absolutely dependent on our shared transportation system. And we're really a desirable region for families to live and businesses to locate. We don't want to lose that. But that's going to take ongoing investments, not just to hold our economy together, but if we're going to be regionally and globally competitive, we've got to raise that investment level, and that's going to take investment at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, what I'd like to do now is just ask a question. Um, we've heard about the um, lack of federal funding, the uncertainty of that, and the potential alternatives around taxes and different things. But how, what do you see um, potentially doing differently that maybe the federal government could help you in terms of tools and each of the states at, at, in terms of tools that would help you meet your funding needs, maybe getting better regulations around public-private partnerships or, um, you know, regulations or something like that. I think funding, we've heard, is a huge uncertainty, but are there other things that, at the federal level or the state level, that they can help you with as leaders of your cities and counties um, that would assist you in meeting the transportation needs, of not only today, but the future? Well, I'm going to be very interested in hearing what uh, Treasurer Wheeler is working on in terms of, uh, you know, some new delivery models. Uh, you know, public-private partnerships have not proven terribly uh, useful here. I mean, the airport light rail project is probably our most uh, signal example of a successful public-private partnership, but that's the exception, not the rule here. Um, you know, frankly, uh, financing is not really a problem for my city and for a lot of local governments. We have a AAA bond rating. We get great costs of debt. It's funding. You know, we have to pay off those bonds. So. Uh, Private, uh, you know, private financing is not superior to AAA bond rated debt. So uh, the, the the use of those alternative models uh, that are so popular in the rest of the world just really hasn't gotten much traction yet uh, in Oregon. I'm not sure uh, if there are really impediments to that so much as uh, you know numerical problems. Uh, I think the idea of tolling federal facilities, uh, you know, which obviously came up in the CRC discussion. 
uh, is another area in which uh, the federal government might be able to open the door to new revenue flows if we were realistic about the need to maintain a system that was conferred on us uh, at a different time with a different uh, revenue stream. Uh, and we call them freeways. Uh, will we call them that <laughs> 25 years from now? <laughs> Deborah? Um, I would just say that uh, when I'm, because I'm confident and optimistic that the federal government will come through um, with new forms of funding, um, that bridges are crucial and not just when we talk about road funding, that it's not just limited to roads, that we really remember that we have a special carve out for bridges. That's been crucial in our ability to maintain in the bridges that we have and again, you know, two of them are 100. So we've done a very good job with the limited resource we have. About we get about six million dollars a year for our bridges. Um, that's not for capital. That's just for maintenance. And we, you know, we've done a great job maintaining these bridges. But that's because we have that money that comes to us. So don't forget the bridges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mentioned several different areas. Um, one I want to highlight for a moment is Map 21. That was probably one of the hardest ones we've had to deal with because it was a very short duration program. It says you're going to have guidelines you have to follow, but we don't know what the guidelines are yet. And we'll complete those guidelines, but it looks like the guidelines are not going to be completed until after the program expires. Okay, so I don't mean to make fun of it, but it adds a burden to us because what do we follow? The, the, the concept is great. Performance measure is absolutely there, but if you're going to do that, set in place a way in which we locally can actually do that. Uh, you know, maybe I'm being picky, but I'd like to measure first, you know, and then the implementation. Um, and, and also then make the decision so it's longer. Am I really hearing something that there might be a bill passed that expires at the end of the year you know, for funding? I mean, now we're moving away from multi-year to where we can measure it in months. At the local level, it makes our head spin. We can't react that fast to it. So there's lots of different options, okay, but whatever it is, when we go through, and let's be honest, if there's a lot of political pain no matter what we do. Do we have to do the political pain every couple of months? You know, can't we do something that kind of spreads it out? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, and lastly, um, you have a great audience here, and uh, I think an uh, educated audience, so, as you, as local leaders, think about what is one thing that you would want this audience to do and, and think about as you have your conversations um, and really um, trying to solve this problem in the future, um, what is the one takeaway that you want them to think about and work on um, with you for the future? I think we have to do uh, at all levels what Congressman Blumenauer is doing at the federal level, which is dare to speak its name, that we have to raise taxes to pay for stuff. And that means we might have to raise the TriMet payroll tax in order to pay for the transit system we want. We probably have to raise the state gas tax or vehicle, mile, uh, vehicle registration fee in the short run. Again, while we're waiting for the new world order of a VMT fee, we still have to live in the present day. So dare to speak its name and raise the state gas tax a lousy five cents so we can fix up Powell Boulevard, stop killing people on it, and transfer it to the city of Portland to maintain it because it should be maintained by the city of Portland. It shouldn't be maintained by ODOT. So we have to have the courage as political leaders, whether we're in elected office or civic life to look our fellow citizens in the face and say stuff isn't free if you want good schools we have to pay for them and in fact the legislature stepped up on that issue last session and funded a much better floor under public education in this state we passed local bond measures to pay for our schools here locally and lately good things we have to do the same thing in transportation we have to pay for the things we use just because the gas tax isn't shown on the pump doesn't mean that we don't pay for these things and we have to be at all levels willing to stick our necks out and say it's time to do this someday we'll get to the perfect system in the meantime we've got to raise our rent on ourselves to take care of the place that we live in I don't think I could have said it better myself. I would just add what others have said, which is to be vocal. I mean, I think having uh, forums like this where we can continue the conversation 
is really, really crucial to getting, moving the ball down the court. And so be vocal. E call and write and, and tell people what you want, what you need, because we can't, we're not gonna, we can't get out there um, without having the support of the public behind us, so thanks. Um, I'm going to cheat. I have two. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> because they're interrelated. The first one is, please continue to invite us in South Washington to the table. Um, and the second one is, be patient with us. We're going, th we're going through some change right now, Mr. Wyatt. <laughs> um, we have a county who is in um, uproar right now. Uh, you will see this fall there will be a resolution advisory vote on our ballot of whether our residents want an East County Bridge. I have no idea where it lands in Oregon <laughs> because no one has been asked about that part of it. <laughs> okay, so that's where the patience comes in, but it's also illustrative that we both need to be at the table. We are a combined region. Our economy, especially our freight, is critically dependent on our ability to move goods around our major corridors, and we both have populations that are commuting. So uh, that's my plea. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your comments. A big round of applause. Charlie, Deborah, Jack, thank you very much for putting a very real and urgent local face on this. Uh, Jack, you say be patient uh, with you. Uh, be patient with us uh, as well on the federal level. Don't give up on us yet. Uh, Charlie, your point about uh, the other items being devolved, uh, know that I am actually working with some of the same stakeholders on a water trust fund uh, that actually we think is kind of creative. It would be voluntary. We've got some ideas about how we can, might start to capitalize a water trust fund uh, to start moving into this area and maybe get the federal government back in a reasonable partnership. And I couldn't agree with you more about the Superfund tax, which expired in 1995. Uh, we are, um, we've been reintroducing that, uh, attempting to make sure that the federal government does its job uh, there. Um, so there are other pieces as long as, as, as well as transportation, and we're attempting to work. And I am pleased that many of the same stakeholders here, like um, AGC, uh, have been uh, uh, deeply involved with, uh, with those areas as well. Um, the, uh, we want to uh, move to the last panel. Uh, Mike MacArthur, uh, so, there you are, Mike. Uh, uh, I thought uh, the, the panel we just had sort of got down into some of the elements of uh, here that uh, things that really matter for us in a little more direct way. And I appreciate, Mike, your being here uh, representing the Association of Oregon Counties, a guy from the east side, although you went to school on this side of the mountains. Uh, but the work that you're doing with AGC, your roots in Eastern Oregon, uh, and willingness to uh, join with us today um, to, uh, uh, with uh, our next panel to be able to uh, continue that focus on the challenges, how the pieces get together, and what makes a difference. Mike, right, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Congressman uh, Blumenauer for rallying the troops here today. That's what I think this is. It feels like a rally. We're all getting behind the idea of transportation infrastructure and funding. I hope my panel can find their way here. Um, I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, Congressman mentioned uh, there is one thing we share in common. That's a diploma from Lewis and Clark College dated 1970. Um, the difference was I played football. He played politics. I think we just have different kinds of head injuries. <laughs> Uh, so I'm the county guy um, and uh, represent 36 counties, uh, 120 commissioners and judges. There's a couple of them here. I've seen Commissioner Ludlow from Clackamas, Commissioner Scouten from Washington. Um, so uh, transportation is an awfully big deal to counties. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into this. Uh, some of my teams here today, I'd like for them to stand up, raise their hand. Uh, Emily Acklin right here is the County Road Program Manager at the Association of Counties. Mary Stern is our Transportation Policy Advisor. Daniel Hauser is our answer man, I call him. Uh, technical advisor at uh, AOC. Um, so we have a great panel here uh, today. We have uh, 
on the far end, uh, Carmen Four, and Carmen has a strong background in transportation, having served with Congressman DeFazio uh, as his deputy chief of staff, and then uh, was a staff to the House Transportation Committee, now the governor's transportation policy advisor. Uh, closer to me, uh, Representative Tobias Reed, chair of the uh, House Transportation and Economic Development Committee, been in the legislature since 2006. I understand he's a refugee from Idaho. Um, and and ne next to him, uh, closest to me here, is uh, Commissioner Steve Novick, City of Portland. Steve's got a long history in politics. I understand he did a little legal work in D.C. at one time. Um, and more significantly, I understand you're getting married Saturday, Mr. Novick. So. <laughs> So if you'll indulge me for a moment, I wanted to tell a little story, but as I set out from Sherman County this morning, looking out across from where I live, I saw, I noticed again, the, the uh, first paved road in the, north, in the Northwest, which happens to exist uh, just across from Sherman County in the Washington side at, at uh, Mary Hill. And uh, it was built by Sam Hill with the help of Samuel Lancaster in 1911. Sam Hill, uh, quite a visionary, uh, lots of big ideas, but he saw paved roads as the key to the future of uh, the economy of, the, of the, the area. And he tried to get people excited about this idea. The Mary Hill Castle actually has ramps that you can drive cars up into it. Um, and uh, anyway, kind of interesting, Sam was a railroad guy. His father-in-law was James J. Hill, the railroad guy. And so um, for Sam to do this was really kind of fascinating. And uh, this, this road is so well engineered, you could drive up it in a Model T in high gear, apparently. It still exists today. They have a number of events there. Uh, but Sam tried to get folks to come see it. And he tried to get the Washington legislature excited about paved roads by taking, getting them involved in this. They were not interested. Sound familiar? So um, <laughs> he, in 1911, he invited the entire Oregon legislature to get on a train in Vancouver his father-in-law's train, ride out to Mary Hill, I guess they had quite a, quite a day, or days, and to see this. And, and uh, he got buy-in from the Oregon legislature and the business community here in Portland. I think that's key. He was connected to the business folks here in Portland and got them excited about building a road um, in roads, Columbia River, or Columbia Gorge Highway, of course, was the, the first of those. But it went on from there. In 1911, the legislature actually passed the first registration fee. A side note was in the first uh, fee on licensing was passed in 1905, which the state then kept all the money. And uh, that led to the county commissioners and judges forming an association to go get a piece of that. That's us. Um, <laughs> So in 1913, we, or 1911, we were able to get a piece of the shared revenue from the registration fee. But that continued a long, a long career that Sam had in advocating for good roads and more roads with the Oregon legislature, clear up into the 30s. And his vision then was a pitchfork. The Highway 30 or 84 across the top, the tines were Highway 101, I-5, 97. And that's the backbone of what we have today. So the question that occurred to me is, that was Sam's vision back then. He sold that to the Oregon legislature. Um, I don't know that there was federal government involved at that point, but what's our vision today? So I know this panel has lots to say, so I'm gonna turn it over to them. Carmen, I think the governor proposes, so let's start there. <laughs> um, that's a broad question on what the vision is for today. There's the, my ability to get the microphone in front of me. Um, I think that's actually really important, and I'm glad the last panel went into great detail on the, uh, on the, the fundamental structures of the Federal Highway Trust Fund, but it seems to me our vision, first off, is how do we look at the entire state as a whole, and how do we consider the needs of all Oregonians. Our ability to move anything as it relates to transportation needs to speak to all communities uh, within our state, and how we, and the roads and rail connections, our bike paths, ports, all of those pieces uh, really interconnect us in a way that's extremely powerful. But I think part of our vision needs to speak beyond uh, uh, the times we're living in today. A lot of transportation in the last 10, 15 years has been a bit back to the future, uh, meaning, you know, bikes are groovy and streetcars are, are the way to go. And it's part of that is why that's so important is 
we had thought in the 50s we got it and we pulled a lot of this infrastructure up and we were going to be liberated in our cars only to become victims to our cars but a few decades later. So there was a lot of wisdom in how do we create modes of transportation that create efficiencies and help people get around better and help us use our roads in a better way to move goods and services around. And I think similarly now, what is that next step forward? How do we move people and goods in longer distances uh, to connect one region of our state to another, to better understand the economies in our state, and to be more efficient to help our environment be better improved? Uh, we certainly know uh, transportation creates a lot of you know, pollution in our air. It harms a lot of people in terms of their health. And there are a lot of interesting advances in technology that we can take advantage of that can really help us advance the conditions for people on a whole host of social goods. Um, but within that is how do we use the system? How do people get around? Really understanding the sociology and the psychology of how people live within their communities and their day-to-day -day matters quite a little bit. Um, and then as people are thinking about how do we form our communities and then outwardly how do we connect to our larger state and that, beyond that how do we connect to a larger region and we want to reach out to those economies outside of our own borders and then where do we see ourselves positioned in the larger world. You know, the world is much more interconnected now and it will continue to become, this big place will continue to become very small. And where do we want to play in that? How do the, our airports and our ports and our roads and our railroads all help us achieve that greater connectivity to communities and uh, on the other side of the ocean or on the other side of our country? So I've always found on this issue, it's a very dynamic, interesting time for that reason because we really get to think through a whole lot of stuff by talking about things that may not seem as interesting. Asphalt, steel, uh, you know, making cars more efficient. But it really is a great way for us to vision where we want to be in 50 years or what is the legacy we want to leave for future generations. So um, I hope that's good enough visioning for you to start. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Representative. Well, in, in introducing uh, Carmen, Mike used the first half of a, of a phrase many of you know the governor proposes the second half is the, legisla the legislature disposes. Um, but in this case, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, in fact, I'm very hopeful that we're going to be able to take uh, the vision that Carmen outlined so well and build on it in the legislature. I think one of the keys to that is creating the confidence amongst voters and amongst legislators that the dollars we are able to, uh, to generate from a variety of sources, some of which we've already talked about, more of which I expect we'll talk about, uh, that those, those dollars are used well. And there are a variety of ways that, uh, that we're able to do that. Uh, we're already talking about the, uh, the road use charge, both as a mechanism uh, to generate revenue and as a, as a way of making sure that it's, um, that it's well used. You've also heard, I imagine, about the West Coast Infrastructure Exchange uh, and some other important uh, ways that we're going to be able to, to use those dollars. What I've learned uh, in my time in the legislature is that a transportation system that works well is one that offers people choices, um, that, that responds to the situations people find themselves in, um, and that is real to them. So I think those, those are the two pieces I, I really hope we can, we can take away from today. Um, I'm proud of the fact that we were able to make uh, bike and pedestrian projects eligible in the Connect Oregon process. Um, we I go back in my, in my mind to a, a discussion a couple of uh, rural legislators had in front of our committee early on in the session about uh, a bike overpass they wanted on a highway in their rural part of the state, not because they felt good necessarily about uh, bikes, but because that would allow the freight that was moving through that area uh, to move more efficiently and better. So I think that connection, that recognition of, of uh, choices uh, for transportation users uh, is really important. And I think um, the other thing is to really make the, uh, the impact of transportation choices real to people. It's easy in this educated room to talk about the importance and impacts of transportation infrastructure uh, to the economy, but to a person who might be trying to keep his or her job, get his or her kid to do some homework, get some dinner on the table, um, that's I think one of our challenges, to make that real. So if we can talk more about what it's going to, the time it's going to take to get to your kid's soccer game, uh, the confidence that if you need it, a fire truck or an ambulance can get to you quickly, um, all of those things that are more real for people in their daily lives, I think help us um, talk about the vision that we want for transportation. So I appreciate being here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, as it happens, I have visions of pitchforks too. And they're coming straight at me. <laughs> so 
I want to start by thanking Mayor Hales for assigning me to the Transportation Bureau. It's something I actually asked for because I can't think of a more important issue to work on. I mean, if we don't maintain a functioning transportation system, then we don't have a functioning economy and people can't function very well in their daily lives. And we should be thinking about the opportunities from improving our transportation system. I mean, if we make it easier for more people to take transit and walk and bike, then people will be healthier, for one thing, and that'll reduce health care costs. And I can't think of too many things more important to improving our economy than reducing the burden of health care costs. And if we do all those things and get people out of their cars, that'll make it easier for freight that has to move by truck to move. And, of course, if we do all those things, we'll be doing our part to address climate disruption. And, of course, what we do here will have very little impact on what happens with climate disruption worldwide. So maybe it's more important to think of it as if we are prepared to have alternatives to the individual automobile, then our citizens will be in much better shape if the federal government ever steps up and puts a price on carbon. So I'm honored to have a chance to work on those issues. And also in Portland, we have serious equity issues when it comes to transportation. There's too many places in East Portland and parts of Southwest where kids have to walk along busy streets in ditches in order to get to school, or seniors have to do the same thing to get to transit. Uh, so that's why the mayor and I are very committed to ensuring that we make investments in improving the equity of our transportation system in anything that we do. So I am excited, I'm still excited about this job, but I'm also in a constant <laughs> state, but I'm also scared because of the public trust problems that we face. People, I think, have been losing trust in government across America for the last 40 years, largely because of stagnating or declining middle class incomes. And it's natural that people lose faith when it seems like the system isn't working for them. And it's interesting, I take, made a habit recently of reading the online comments to newspaper articles and other cities that are considering transportation funding mechanisms, like Duluth, Minnesota, and Corpus Christi, Texas. And the language is exactly the same, only the names of the alleged pet projects change. <laughs> In Duluth, well, they have plenty of money if they weren't blowing it all renovating the North Shore Theater. And in Corpus Christi, well, you know, they'll spend it all on the Bayfront, like they always do. Here, they think we're blowing it all at the track, the streetcar track, of course. <laughs> uh, and it's, I mean, that lack of public trust is a, is a serious, serious problem. Um, John Charles mentioned the auditor's report. A lot of people think that the auditor wrote a report that said, we'd have plenty of money for transportation if we weren't blowing it all on pet projects. Now, if you read the Portland Tribune carefully, you'd know that what actually the auditor said is we have a 75 million a year deficit just in pavement maintenance. And we spent $16 million a year on other things that the auditor thought maybe we might not have done. Number one in that list is the Selwood Bridge. Um, that paying the debt on that is costing us $6.5 million a year. Thank you, Deborah Gavori. Um, and, but I mean, I don't think too many people think of the Selwood Bridge as a pet project but it's the biggest thing on a list that's referred to as the list of all of our pet projects. Number two in that list is the streetcar, which is costing us to operate about $4 million a year. Now one might argue, as I have, that the general fund should pick up a chunk of the streetcar costs as opposed to general transportation revenues, and some people think it's a pet project, but other people say that it's been a huge um, economic development mechanism. And then there's a few other things, like uh, a couple million dollars a year for Portland-Milwaukee light rail, and for renovating the downtown transit mall. But all in all, it adds up to $16 million a year, and which means that if we take the auditor at word, we have still have a, if we did none of those things, we still have a $59 million a year deficit just for pavement maintenance. But that's not the story that gets told. If you read the Oregonian editorials, they'll t they, you would get the idea that we'd have plenty of money if we didn't blow it all in pet projects. If you read Willamette Week, which used to be a progressive paper, you'll, they'll say, how could Novick say that he needs more money for street maintenance when he's spending $600,000 um, joining with the rest of the region, um, paying for an EIS for a Southwest Corridor high capacity transit? Now, I kind of thought that Willamette Week believed in climate disruption and would believe in uh, investing in high capacity transit, but that apparently is no longer true. 
So we are operating in an environment of general public distrust, which is magnified by an increasingly unpleasant media environment. Again, if you read the Tribune, which I think occupies the same space that the Oregonian used to, sort of a solid, responsible paper, and if you read the Mercury, which a couple of weeks ago did a breakdown of here's where the city's general fund goes. It goes to police, fire, and parks. If you want them to take money for streets out of the general fund, that's what it comes from. If you read those two papers, then, you, then that would be helpful. Um, and I hope more and more people are reading them. But otherwise, we're operating in a really difficult environment. Um, and I mean, the mayor and I obviously have made the decision that we're going to keep on plugging along. We're not going to sweep this issue under the rug for another six years because the problem keeps on getting worse and worse. But I have to tell you, uh, I kind of thought of uh, Tamara's speech earlier as an early wedding present because it was so refreshing to hear the chair of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce say that some of her conservative colleagues say they're wasting tons of money. And she says, yeah, there might be waste, but that's not an excuse for doing nothing. Tamara, I wish I could take you to every single meeting that we have. Uh, we've got right now, I mean, even pretty sophisticated people, we have a business work group talking about ways to raise money for transportation. And these are pretty sophisticated people, but they're saying, well, we want to see exactly where you're spending all the rest of your money, which we can do. They're also saying, we're not sure we hold with the safety stuff. And that doesn't mean that they think that people, kids in East Portland should you know, walk in ditches. I think that they're convinced that by safety we mean that we're going to be building golden bike lanes for yuppies. And we have to keep on telling you, no, it's about kids walking safely to school. But they're affected by the same kind of pessimism and cynicism that everybody else seems to have. So um, that's my request for all of you, is to, um, I hope some of you record a Tamara's speech and just go around playing it randomly on the street. Just like hold up your phone and repeat it. Because uh, I think that's the most valuable thing that anybody here could do. Uh, to help us. Thank you very much. So there's a couple of questions that uh, folks asked us to address, and particularly um, the short-term patch that the federal government has put on for transportation funding and how that's going to affect us all. I know at the, at the county level, we depend on the federal transportation dollars for mostly improvement projects. And that makes it very difficult to plan. But there's some other pieces of federal funding that should be ignored. And one comes through the Secure Rural Schools Act. Uh, people don't recognize how much money comes to Oregon from the US Forest Service dollars that went to transportation. Of course, as that's ratcheted further down, that means less, less money available for Oregon uh, counties to use in transportation. Um, counties often have um, their own programs uh, about uh, there are 22 cities have, have gas taxes, some couple of counties, but counties have other mechanisms as well. But not having the federal piece underlaying all that really uh, undermines what we can do. There's another important program called the Federal Lands Access Program, which is access to the federal forest, which is an important funding source for that counties use as well. But how, how would, would the, the short-term patch and the uncertainty about federal uh, funding affect your agencies for your sectors? Carmen, get back to you. Well, I, I think certainly um, when MAP 21 was finished, no one was delighted to have a two-year bill. And what was baked in with MAP 21's time frame, in addition to the fact that there were a lot of rules given without that we're going to um, exhaust beyond the length of the bill, which Stoneman brought up, and I think we sort of knew that from the outset. Um, there's a, there's a reason why those bills last five to six years in length, because you need that amount of time to do the planning and prep work and the construction to completion side. So as we continue to do extensions on MAP 21 and similar to the predecessor safety loo, it just makes it very difficult for states to get on the books the projects we need to move forward. or It creates uncertainty going into next year's construction season or where is it we want to go um, into the future. Uh, you know, and it's sort of at a strange time when we really do know that these investments in transportation translate into a great deal of economic good on the other side of the coin. We have decades of knowing this. We've watched countries around the world make these kinds of investments, even during the 
the dark days of the, the economic uh, recession, uh, but our politics are very stuck in D.C. and creating that inability to just move through that so we can do things that strengthen our nation's economy and here in the state of Oregon um, causes a host of problems. But you know, you've heard all the reasons why there are challenges related to that. I don't know how we get out of that in the short run, but it certainly hinders our ability to get all of these additional good projects off of the ground. I really find a lot more unanimity on the need um, and a lot of ideas on what to do, and we're just stuck on the, the, the framework of political will to get it done. Um, and that would be an interesting part of this conversation. How do you have that breakthrough? I, I agree with that, and I, sadly, I'm not sure that, that the uncertainty um, is making much of a difference in, in the legislature. In a sense, I think it's sort of priced into our to our market already. Um, people sort of expect, I think, um, that this uncertainty will continue. That that Congress may put together another short-term deal. Um, it, it makes it a little bit harder. Um, you know, Steve mentioned the, where the bulk of city money goes. The bulk of the state money, as you know, goes to education, uh, human services, and, and public safety. Um, and in the context that, that we're not able to, to generate the confidence that, that our decisions with state resources are backed up with federal dollars, uh, it makes it harder to argue for increased investments in infrastructure when all those other areas are also uh, hurting. So I think that's, that's difficult. Um, hopefully, um, it, it will create a bit more urgency um, and a bit more willingness to embrace some of these alternative um, funding mechanisms and uh, expenditure processes. I confess that over the past few months, uh, I pretty much hid my head in the sand and didn't ask exactly what the short-term impact would be on city projects if the Highway Trust Fund was allowed to go broke. I mean, I know that there's projects that we're excited about that we are going to need federal money for. I mean, it would be nice to have high capacity transit along Powell Division, um, which we could have at a rather cheaper price than high capacity transit in the Southwest Corridor, but having high capacity transit in the Southwest Corridor is critically important to, to the future of the region too. And we do periodically get piece, bits of federal money for safety projects um, and for freight projects. And I mean, if the pipeline go, goes dry, then we're obviously in serious trouble. Um, but I mean, it's, it's sad to be in the position of uh, applauding a short-term flawed fix, but I think that's unfortunately what all, what all of us have had to do. And I want to, again, thank Congressman Blumenauer for his leadership and his willing, I mean, our, in, remember in 1994, there were a lot of reasons that uh, we lost the House. We, sorry, being a little bit partisan there. There's a lot of reasons that the House switched sides, but I think one of them was the 4.3 cent gas tax increase in 1993. So it does take political courage to talk about that. So there's been uh, a lot of talk in, in Oregon with the Oregon Transportation Forum. I see Craig Campbell out here as the chair of that and lots of folks involved in that discussion about bringing a package to the legislature. One of the things the legislature's talked about in the past uh, of moving toward, and I hear it a lot in the, in the forum discussions, are the, is the vehicle miles travel idea. And maybe, uh, Representative Reed, you could talk about where you think that is and where it's going, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, I think it's, uh, I think we are, I'm proud that, that Oregon is, is a national and, and world leader on that front, and, and great credit um, to, to ODOT uh, and to Jim Whitty in particular. Um, it's a reality, I think, that, that all of us recognize that as cars and the fleets get more efficient, um, the, we're going to be realizing less from the gas, uh, gas tax revenue, and we need to find an alternative. Uh, we believe we've, we've found that and, and that we're um, advancing that conversation through, um, through pilot programs. Uh, we passed a, a 5,000 vehicle pilot program that will be uh, under, uh, underway soon. Um, all of you can, can take part in it. I was fortunate to take part in a much smaller uh, pilot uh, earlier and I can tell you that the biggest complaint I had about it um, was that because they were hurrying to, to get it done, they elected to use PayPal as a funding mechanism or a payment mechanism, and it meant that I had to remember another password. Um, <laughs> but outside of that, it didn't affect anything uh, about our, our driving experience uh, or anything else. We got a, a, a statement each, each month of the three-month pilot 
that accounted for what we paid in gas tax, gave us credit for that, and because of the, the vehicle that we have, it was a matter of a, a dollar or something uh, each of the months. So um, that uh, experience made it much easier for me to talk uh, about what that's like, and I expect that the 5,000 vehicles um, will do the same. Um, there's great advantages to doing that in addition to um, the revenue that, that it makes possible. It, it creates a lot more flexibility in, in how we uh, generate revenue for transportation infrastructure. So um, in addition to that, I think one, one piece that is sometimes underplayed is the real economic development potential. If we continue to hold that leadership spot, figure out how to implement it and all the associated businesses and products and services that can come with it, those kinds of things can be exported to the rest of the world uh, to our benefit. So I think it's I think it's exciting, and I hope you'll all participate. Which you're Steve, ready. you're ready. So, um, so, I mean, I think that BMT is something that we have to we have to think about in the future. Although we'll note that I went to Revolution last fall, and I heard a presentation on transportation funding where somebody said that they recently saw a poll on BMT, and 72 percent were opposed to it until they explained the reasons for it, and after that, 76 percent were opposed to it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, um, and I, I mean, I personally, I mean, think that we should about me. I don't mind still having a gas tax for a while because it is, there is an environmental value to taxing pollution. What I do hope that we're able to do with transportation over the next decade or so is to have funding mechanisms that um, are designed for an era of spectacular income inequality. And I think that the old Jimmy Carter idea that you have a carbon tax of some sort, I don't know if he called it that, but you then ha have a rebate on people's income taxes for low and middle income people to reflect what you think that the average cost is of what they're paying is a fine idea because that, that means that the, in, in effect the tax is less regressive and if you actually change your behavior significantly in your low and middle income you might come out ahead. I mean, one of the frustrating things for me as a lefty working in transportation is that most of our methods of raising funds tend to be regressive. And I find myself wishing we were in Finland and when you get a, when you get a speeding ticket, they immediately hook into your, uh, the equivalent of your IRS data. And if you're the head of Nokia, you get a $75,000 speeding ticket. I mean, you think that would be a fair, that, that'd be a fair system. Um, and I mean, the, the mayor talked about our agnosticism about raising money for transportation. Um, we've got working groups looking at a variety of different mechanisms. Um, I think that we might wind up with sort of a conglomeration of things, which might include some income tax component, because just as a sales tax is familiar to other people, uh, to, to people in other states, the income tax is most familiar to people here. But I mean, again, I mean, the VMT makes, makes sense. I think that we've got hurdles to get over with the public. But again, the biggest hurdle with any form of taxation is the public trust hurdle. Can I just add a couple of things based on what Steve said? It's important. I think you're right. There, there would obviously be a, a, a transition period. Um, older cars don't have the technology to make a road use charge possible. So there would, oh, there, for quite a while, there would be a, a gas tax simultaneously. But people would be paying one or the other, not both. And what we built in um, is, a, is a whole lot of choice for individual drivers at what level they want to participate. So it's not, um, it's not a one size uh, fits all sort of approach. And the flexibility it provides um, does make it possible to do something like what you're describing around an income tax credit to account for that. What I hear frequently, and I hope you'll help me um, respond to this the same way I do, I hear a lot of people say, well, that's not fair. I, I have to drive a lot. And, and I say as politely as I can, could you please tell me how you think that's different than a gas tax? Um, essentially, a gas tax is a proxy uh, for impact on roads. So we do have, uh, we do have work to do to, to help understand what, it, what is it, potentially a, a complicated sort of system, uh, but I think it can work and I think it's important to, to keep moving forward. Um, the setup materials here mentioned one of the congressman's concerns is devolution if the federal government does nothing. And we call it, we're also referred to as balkanization. As local governments adopt fees, property taxes in some cases if it's approved by the voters. A lot of people don't know that you can't use property taxes for roads unless it's approved by the voters. Um, Back in the old days, they used to let you work off your property taxes on a road district. And maybe we go back to that. <laughs> but uh, um, what do you, what, what, what concerns do you have about too much local uh, fundraising that undermines the state and federal efforts? Uh, 
you know, I, I don't know if I'd put those in the same world as devolution. I mean, and I can see we kind of would see that. I think the dynamic of the conversation in DC is coming off a little differently. Um, the, the thing with devolution is it's, you know, or maybe the front end of the conversation, and my former boss used to say, we did that for decades, you know, and it didn't work. And when we created the interstate highway system, it was our way of understanding where we were connected. And if you've watched him speak on the floor, he would flash this board of Amos Schweitzer's farm. And Amos Schweitzer was this farmer in Oklahoma who uh, lived right on the border with Kansas. And when they passed, the two states had passed um, uh, an agreement to build a turnpike. And Kansas, God love them, you know, they finished their turnpike right on time, beautiful four lanes of traffic, just, or four lanes, shouldn't say traffic at that point. And then they did this flyover shot over Amos Schweitzer's farm. And it literally, like this beautiful road, and it stops right on the border into his farm. So good folks, you know, driving along that road would be speeding along, and the next thing you knew, they'd be just launched into the air and landing at Amos's farm. So he was having to, you know, politely, you know, scoop people up out of his farm and apparently build berms and did all sorts of things. But ultimately, and it was because the Oklahoma hadn't passed its money to complete the turnpike, but they were having an internal conflict in their legislature. So, you know, the connectivity piece didn't happen. And uh, so finally, you know, people kind of raised, made hay about it, but it ended up being part of a, of a, a piece in Life magazine to sort of raise the need, in part raise the need at that time for the interstate highway system. You know, that, you know having a clunky, non-connected system benef doesn't benefit anybody. So I think the first part in that devolution conversation is to understand we are all interconnected and to really look at the longer arc of how transportation has and has not worked in this country. Again, much to you know, Congressman Blumenauer's leadership on streetcar, you know, bringing that technology back in to better help move people around. You know, having a system that interconnect makes a huge difference. When states and localities want to pass uh, roads, road funds, or other funds to build, you know, public infrastructure, it should be in part to build within those communities. What is it they want to do? What, where is it they want to go? And cities, counties, and states have their own road systems and their own needs. One shouldn't, you know, preclude the other. I think, though, uh, we, it, we're better served in Oregon to sit down and kind of have a more comprehensive conversation about our needs. And what we're really threading the needle on is politically, how do we get these pieces done? What's been clear to me is you ticked off how many cities have their own and how many counties have their own. We've been able to pass uh, state, been able to raise funds at the state level. How we do it in a way so we're sensitive and, you know, keep continuing to improve the system as the whole doesn't preclude our ability to, to do these pieces, nor should it. Um, we really do need to be sensitive about how much folks are having to pay. I mean, the point of this exercise is, you know, you, you pay to use it. You know, we're all paying in to maintain these roads, bridges, and highways, and for those of us who have that obligation to do it, we need to take that responsibility quite seriously. Oregonians expect us to get that job done. If it's not being done well and we don't have the resources, we have to be real clear about what we're raising and what the need is and why. And what I found from community to community is people, if you really say what you mean and you do the work and they can see it and you hold that faith, people will come back the next time and they'll say, okay, you did that work, we're good to go again. Obviously, the, the gas tax piece at the federal level created a whole different dynamic, a whole political uh, stasis, but it would be tough for me to say that community X shouldn't you know, look at what it needs to do to improve its infrastructure because the state as a whole wants to pass something or this county that I live in and that county shouldn't. I mean, we need to, again, really better understand we all benefit from these systems running very, very well. I don't think I can improve on that. <laughs> uh, I appreciate Carmen saying that uh, she wouldn't say that local government shouldn't do whatever they need to do. I mean, it, but having different funding mechanisms in different locations can, is problematic. I mean, if we in Portland uh, had a significant local gas tax, then there would probably be people who use our roads who would, would but who don't live in the city, but it would just gas, gas up somewhere else, or maybe even if it was high enough, there might be some, a few people who would leave the city in order to gas up and then come back in. I, mean, I think the number of people who do that is probably limited, but it is something to worry about. 
Um, if we have a local income tax to fund streets, then again, people who are coming in from out of town and don't live here, assuming it's a, ta assuming it's a tax on just on Portlanders, are paying their fair share. Um, there is an argument, just in, in, from that perspective, for the sales tax as a means of raising revenue for transportation, because then at least people who are coming to Portland to shop, uh, particularly from places where they have much higher sales tax, would be paying their share. Um, so, um, it, I mean, yes, it does worry me that we that, that the idea of having a bunch of different funding sources in a bunch of different localities, but it doesn't worry me enough that I'm not prepared to do it. So we were asked, or it was asked earlier, what our national organizations that we represent are doing uh, to try and promote the idea of the transportation funding and support uh, what's going on in D.C. I know, I believe, that National Association of Counties is all in. And you know, Congressman, if they're not, I'd not sure like to hear about it, but they tell me that they're very much engaged with lots of data, lots of, lots of uh, information about the needs, and uh, a strong advocate. So what about uh, uh, the National League of Cities, legislators, governors? Getting unanimity from any group of legislators is a, is a pretty big thing, but but uh, we're fortunate to have the uh, the current president of the National Conference of State Legislators is uh, Bruce Starr, our, our senator who's also uh, on the Transportation Committee in the Senate. So I think there's a reason to be very confident about NCSL's active engagement. Uh, I'm just assuming that the League of Cities is all in, Mr. Mayor. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah. Um, as for the governors, uh, Governor Kitzhaber Cole had a bipartisan letter earlier this year uh, with 17 other go governors encouraging uh, Congress and the administration to uh, fully fund the highway trust fund. Since that time, uh, co-chairs of a relevant transportation committee within the National Governors Association have also sent a letter. So I don't know with the other governors if they've individually weighed in with their delegation or not. I wouldn't say uh, the Governors Association as a whole has come out in unanimity, but many, many governors across party lines and from all parts of the country have been uh, consistently calling for um, full funding of the Highway Trust Fund. Okay. I think that um, about uses our time. Is there any last thoughts anyone has they'd like to leave with the audience? I just want to pick up on what Steve said and, and maybe a slight um, amendment to your suggestion that everyone play Ms. Lundgren's uh, speech <laughs> everywhere. I think that's great. The other thing that I think uh, I'd, I'd love to have everybody do is just look for those opportunities to put your own voice alongside Ms. Lundgren's. Um, how transportation impacts you and why it matters. We're all, um, we're fortunate, I think, to, to, to know something about this, but each of us interacts with people from our most disinterested neighbors and families and uh, people we encounter in the grocery store and everywhere else. Lots of room to disagree, but I don't think there's very much, uh, at least in this room, uh, a reason to, to not be unanimous on, on the need for greater infrastructure investment. So we've got to spend and spread that, uh, that word. I hope you'll help. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of shout outs. One, although I have my differences with the Oregonian editorial board, I mean, a lot of the, their reporting is helpful. I mean, particularly, we revamped the way we do disabled parking in the city, and it's freed up a bunch of parking spaces. Um, and the paper has done a good job of, of the Oregonian's done a good job of covering that. I also wanted to give a shout out, I saw Rob Sadowski earlier, to the Bicycle Transportation Alliance in particular, because they are one group that in the course of the discussion of the street fee, we have not made any promises to them in terms of how much money we would spend on bicycle infrastructure. And unlike with the gas tax, their, their folks would be paying it. Um, and they've been consistently supportive um, in spite of that lack of promises and the fact that their constituency would be paying. So I just wanted to, I wanted to let them know that I appreciate that. Um. I want to thank Congressman Blumenauer for organizing this event and for bringing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce leadership team out here. Um, and I think for all of us to really recognize and appreciate our federal delegation, how hard it is to do this work in D.C. Across um, the aisle, we have a very strong delegation that supports transportation infrastructure, and Congressman Blumenauer is really pushing the envelope on the conversation with his 
work and really advocating uh, gas tax increase or that kind of support. And it's one thing, you know, I don't want to say sitting here in the cheap seats, but also knowing the other side of the coin that, you know, there's a price that he pays for doing that, for being the leader on that front. And we should all be very appreciative and grateful for his leadership. And also when you do get the chance to uh, thank other members of the delegation who worked diligently and Senator Wyden in particular for his work on the Finance Committee to really help negotiate that extension, um, we are hardly out of uh, the, the woods, the, you know, out of the weeds, I should say. We've got a lot more work left to do. So it's not only for those of us here who can all nod and generally agree in the right direction, it's how do we reach out to our organizations and individuals in the rest of the country to help with that work, um, but really to keep being rational voices in this conversation. I mean, it's really, if we can't get the business of maintaining our shared transportation infrastructure in our state and in our country, you know, my God, where are we? Uh, so this is something we should be able to do. So thank you for organizing this group and really appreciate all of your hard work. Uh, we are in the process here of uh, wrapping up. I will say how much I appreciated uh, this last panel and starting from the beginning with Tamara and going right through, uh, being able to look at the big picture that we're all uh, linked to, thinking about, and want to move forward. Um, I must say that despite some of the negativity uh, that uh, has been emanating from Washington, uh, how pleased I am in this particular transportation space we're seeing some amazing progress. The editorials, I, I wish the New York Times editorial would have been two days earlier. It would have helped us in the house um, and felt a little guil guilty harassing them for the last six months. But the Times came out with a great editorial. USA Today, the Washington Post, the LA Times, uh, we're, uh, the Bloomberg, we're watching uh, a, uh, a systematic uh, focus on the issue. Uh, Gail Collins, God lover, uh, elevated the Romney dog Seamus to near Rushmorean proportions. Um, and I confess to having been sending stuff to Gail and saying, do the same thing with the gas tax. And I noted that she just had her third or fourth column uh, mentioning it. Uh, we're watching things starting to take place. Um, I had, uh, I, I see some changes with the administration. One of the things I try and make clear in the presentations I have made uh, over the last six or seven, eight years, this is not a partisan issue. There's enough partisan blame to go around. Um, uh, the Bush administration wouldn't embrace the recommendations of their commissions um, and kind of, we had a little paralysis. The Obama administration has not been a profile in courage on the gas tax, although I will say uh, that I am encouraged that at least they've offered up uh, a piece of legislation. And in conversations I've had, including uh, a staff breakdown in the White House where I got five minutes with the big guy one-on-one -on, -one on, uh, on uh, gas tax and dealing with other members of the administration, they have changed position. They will accept uh, a bill that comes out of the, uh, the uh, Congress uh, on any uh, uh, moving forward on a gas tax. They're no longer leaving it off the table. I know that's not massive uh, progress in the minds of many of you, but trust me, given where we have been for the last uh, almost uh, 14 years, that's progress. Um, I am encouraged with the depth of involvement that we've had articulated here in terms of business, in terms of the professions, in terms of government, advocacy group. Uh, we're not seeing uh, bicyclists versus truckers. We're not seeing the asphalt versus the concrete people. Uh, we're not seeing labor versus business. We are seeing people come together and put aside uh, some differences. They're not uh, ignoring the fact that they have different points of view, but their commitment to move forward with adequate funding for a six-year bill that America needs, uh, I find heartening. Um, people understand that this effort is going to be stronger if it includes all of the elements. We need to be able to move freight in this country. We also need for kids to be able to walk and bike to school safely on their own. 
We need to make sure that there are the transportation transit choices for people that are fair, affordable, and accessible. Um, and to me, this is a sea change in terms of watching people playing nice together and understanding that if we're all at the table focusing on solutions and our vision, it's stronger than if somebody goes off on their own. Those initiatives, given the lack of trust uh, that has been referenced, uh, the lack of trust uh, requires that people are there dealing with a comprehensive vision and making sure that everybody has a role to play and that people are willing to do things differently. Whether it's a vehicle mile traveled, whether it's congestion pricing, whether it's new uses of technology, or pushing back on some of the bureaucratic notions that we've been captive to. Uh, for me, this is extraordinarily encouraging. Uh, but uh, we promised everybody we'd be out by noon, if not before. But we do have a couple of microphones here, and I have a few minutes of time. And I would welcome if there's somebody who's been listening patiently uh, who would like to come forward if somebody has uh, a minute that they want to share uh, with our viewing audience uh, and uh, uh, with the folks that are here. If you could gravitate towards the microphone. See, John, you're in the back. You might get beaten to the punch. We would ask people to uh, respect the notion that we, we want to hear from as many people as possible. Uh, and so if we could do it in a minute or thereabouts, we would appreciate it. Commissioner? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for convening this group today. And I was just curious, did you use that description of Multnomah County and how we got the bridges when you were a Multnomah County Commissioner? A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple things. I'm concerned about two things, the aging workforce. I'm concerned about the poverty rates in the state of Oregon. I don't know if you all know, but in the last 10 years, we have grown our poverty by 16%. So when I listen to your 1.7% of federal investment in transportation, I'm thinking, wow, we're doing something really great here in Oregon. We're growing our poverty, but that's not what direction we need to be going in. So for me, as I look, about, look at this about transportation infrastructure, I was wondering if we could marry training and education with low-income people to make sure that they get those jobs. Because I was looking at our transportation department. Karen's sitting back there. We have 4,500 employees. In the next five to seven years, 40% of those folks will be eligible for retirement. Now, I'm really concerned about this. Wondering if we get all this money, say we have all the money in the world for infrastructure, who's going to work in these transportation jobs? I think our most room for growth is low-income people and underserved people in Oregon. And I really would like you to take that message back to, to Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Jerry Cohn from AARP, ARP uh, to you, as you know. And thank you again for your leadership. Uh, so often uh, it makes communities livable for all ages. And just paying, playing off that theme, I wanted, if you could, uh, address briefly again how building, and again, the engagement opportunity, which builds trust, um, looking at uh, whether I'm 8, 58, or 88 or above, um, how this all works together when it comes to the aging of our communities, demographically, but also in terms of what makes Oregon, Oregon. Thank Jerry, I, I would prefer, I'm happy to talk at a drop of a hat, but I, I would like to hear from as many folks here. But suffice it to say, uh, picking up on what Loretta said and what you're just raising, this is uh, a challenge for us all that will benefit everybody. More transportation choices helps people whether they're six or 96. Uh, more opportunities to put men and women to work rebuilding and renewing America provides any number of opportunities uh, for family wage jobs all along the skill continuum. And I see John here, he might have something to say about that in a moment, but I'm going to try not to say anything. I'm John Russell, a long fan of Earl and a former member of the Transportation Commission of the state. Uh, the Transportation Committee of the Oregon Business Association will promote two ideas to the upcoming legislature. 
The less important is an increase in the gas tax, but instead of uh, making it proportional to the increase in inflation, make it indexed to the price of asphalt. There's a clear <laughs> nexus. When you pay the gas tax, you're buying asphalt. But it clearly has several limitations. One, it doesn't capture the electric cars. Secondly, it's, it's in front of your face several times a day as you pass a, a, a gas station. And third, it is mildly regressive. So the more important issue that we are promoting is the idea to pay more attention to the registration fees. Uh, I have a friend with a six-car garage. The registration fee is progressive. Um, <laughs> it's only paid every two years, uh, but we recommend that you follow the lead of European countries and make the registration fee proportionate to the horsepower. Uh, Pete Truex, the mayor of the city of Forest Grove. Um, National League of Cities and the League of Oregon Cities. I serve on the board for the league and our, uh, one of our legislative priorities this year, in fact, the, the number one legislative priority will be to work on funding a comprehensive transportation package for the state legislature, and that runs right alongside the National League of Cities' uh, intense interest in, in the transportation program and your transportation proposals. So uh, we're acting in concert, as was uh, addressed earlier. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> My name is Jim Howell. I'm with the Association of Oregon Rail and Transit Advocates, otherwise known as EORTA. Uh, about a dozen years ago, uh, the tugboat, uh, Columbia River Tugboat Association, asked the local leaders if they couldn't do something about the railroad bridges, old ancient swing span, which was so dangerous. Uh, they have to go through them as they're hauling their <coughs> barges down the river. And the local uh, leaders agreed with them and uh, because there was some benefits to this besides their safety but also to the railroad and, and also to the highway that would reduce the number of lifts on the highway bridge by as many as 90 percent. They agree agreed with them and they asked the Coast Guard to investigated. The Coast Guard did a cost-benefit analysis. And unfortunately, uh, they said it wouldn't pass because all the benefits, most of the benefits, fell upon the highway. Uh, and they hadn't had enough accidents with their tugboats and their barges hitting the railroad bridge that they couldn't qualify. So, so there's a solution there. So, well, yeah. <laughs> But nevertheless, about the same time, uh, this whole idea of the CRC came up, and it sort of got this this bridge issue got put on the uh, on the back burner. Uh, now that the CRC, I guess, is on the back burner, uh, how about taking this project off the back burner and looking at it again because it would have a tremendous impact on the highway as well as safety of the the river and uh, it uh, and maybe you as a, a a representative could have a little influence on the Coast Guard to maybe tweak their rules that would allow the benefits for the highway to be used <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to ask you and the local leadership whether we can't get this thing uh, back on the table thank you and thanks for pushing for more gas tax. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, John Holtz with the Oregon State Building Trades Council. Uh, there's been several speakers today, starting with Tamara Lundgren, that have spoken to the need to find additional dollars to fund infrastructure projects, as well as possibly looking at alternative methods and possibly using pension funds. Our pension funds <coughs> have invested billions of dollars in private projects throughout the United States over the past several decades. Public projects, not so much. Yet in Canada, in Australia, and many countries in Europe, they use their pension funds robustly to invest in infrastructure projects. Treasurer Wheeler asked probably my favorite question of the day here today. Why are we investing Oregon dollars in funds that fund infrastructure projects in China 
and other countries around the world instead of doing it right here. We've got funds in place already. What they need is they need dollars and they need direction. And so I would ask everybody in this room to please urge decision makers to look at alternative methods of delivering projects, possibly public-private partnerships and others, and to invest organ dollars and pension dollars in infrastructure projects here in Oregon. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. I thought it was really great conversation. I'm Brian Davis with uh, Lancaster Engineering. We're a small traffic engineering firm here in Portland. And so I spend my day to day thinking about uh, the safety and the efficiency of the transportation system. Theoretically in that order, although in practice, the reverse order a lot. Um, and I think it's important to point out that these are often competing priorities. Sometimes you can't have both. Um, as an example, if I were to design a facility that can handle efficiently the crush of traffic at 5 p.m. I've also designed a facility that would encourage people to drive way too quickly at midnight. Um, and this is, I think, a problem that's responsible for far more fatalities and serious injuries than crumbling bridges. Uh, so when we talk about the economic impact of gridlock, um, I think there's two lenses through which we could look at this problem. One of not having enough capacity on our roadways, which is how we've historically looked at it, or one of having too much volume on our roadway, too much unnecessary volume. Uh, it sounds like a lot of the decision makers in the room today are looking at it this way and looking at ways to reduce single occupant vehicle travel, but I haven't heard a lot about how we might do this. I haven't heard a lot about what the transportation system is going to look like in 20 or 30 years. And I'm very excited to be in Portland, very close to the opening of what's really going to be an awesome new bridge, first of its kind in the country, and something I think that's gonna be really, really terrific in terms of transit infrastructure, bike and pet infrastructure, good ways to reduce single occupant vehicle travel. Um, I, would, I would ask you guys to figure out what the next big thing is going to be. What grand opening, what ribbon cutting are we going to be going to in 10 years from now that's going to change the game again, that's going to you know, cement Portland at the forefront of transportation issues the way that this new bridge is going to, uh, to do that when I think it opens in 2015. Thanks. Thanks so much for having this, this conversation, Congressman. Um, I'm Chris Rawl, I'm with Transportation for America. Just wanted to kind of put forth two ideas. One is we're, we're using the term devolution to describe something that um, could also be called a defunding of the federal program. We're not talking about this funding, or at least in proposals have been out there coming back to the states. We have to then go ahead and figure out what we're gonna do at the state and local level if, you know, if things are going in that direction that you know, we, we're trying to resist and, and push back on. So thank you for having a conversation around this and trying to figure out how we can, how we can uh, increase federal funding. Um, the, the second piece is, is kind of just a, a question. Um, we're really focused on trying to maintain the federal program. There's always this challenge about how to get uh, good policy into that program, continue to improve that policy so it's address, addressing this changing world. And so just kind of a, uh, open question to you and, and to folks in this room, how, how do we make sure that we're, we're continuing to, to reform that policy so that we're addressing this changing world? Again, thanks, Congressman, for bringing this together. Go out different to all. Chris, this wasn't staged, uh, but uh, uh, I serve on the Transportation Committee for National League of Cities, and one of the issues that we're talking about in terms of this notion of getting money back to the locals is uh, Chris's T4 proposal with the competitive uh, grants, uh, jury that is, versus uh, direct suballocation for greater funding directly to cities. Don't want you to spot to this now, because like you said, though, we can talk offline, but I just want to have a conversation with some of your staff about your perceptions of which of those approaches have greater legs and which ones we can put our shoulder behind. Uh, you know, we're happy on anything that creates more income to the revenue to the local level. The other thing, a comment I just want to make to John Charles' point, uh, I get an opportunity to get in and out of O'Hare quite often, uh, with either driving or taking the bus, or the CTA or whatever, and golly, the tolling that they're doing around on the interstate system around there over the last 10 years has been tremendous in terms of reducing congestion, access in and out, not, not just the airport, the whole area around there. I mean, sure, when you get into the core, you know, 10 million people, it's, it's tough. But so we could take a lesson, I think, from folks 
choosing to purchase with their credit card the ability to avoid congestion by having more lane miles created um, and freer flow of traffic in very congested areas. Uh, I-5 is difficult. Great. Thanks for the last word, Mr. Mayor. Oh, John, uh, 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 Joe, do you? Very quickly, uh, Joe Wesley with the IBW. Uh, many of you know me as the uh, business agent for the IBW and union guy and all that. Uh, strangely, I have been in contact with a group of institutional investors from Germany who want to invest in America and particularly Oregon for infrastructure, etc. I, I, a while back, I gave the information. I talked to them recently. They are still interested. I asked them about the courthouse, about the hospital, about the hotel, bridge. And, uh, they own the streetlights in New York City. So there are people out there looking to use that model of the public-private money uh, partnership. Just uh, yep. when they come back, I'm going to have them be meeting some, some other people. I'm going to be A, O, B, C. John, I see you there. I'll look you up. Thank you. Thank you. And we do need to, I think, uh, be open-minded to have opportunities uh, for other investment streams, uh, resources. Uh, part of what uh, the mayor said, however, was that for most of what they're concerned with, uh, with the AAA bond rating, it's not that they can't sell bonds. It's having uh, a source of money to be able to service the bonds, having an income flow. That's part of what we, I think an, invest, uh, an infrastructure bank would be a great idea, but you have to capitalize the bank. So these things, I think, come hand in hand, but we ought to be open-minded uh, for sources of capital, putting it to work. We thank you. This is a lot of intellectual capital that's been invested here this morning. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time and energy. Uh, I walk away with uh, some uh, new ideas, a couple of factoids, and uh, renewed energy, and look forward to uh, going into the home stretch before this Congress adjourns that you uh, help us not let Congress off the hook to be able to make sure that before the Congress adjourns that we are focused on meeting our responsibility with the Transportation Trust Fund, not kicking it into the next year, and look forward to working with all the constituent groups to be able to carry that message. Thank you very, very much.